Hey guys, this is Robert Breedlove from the What Is Money Show. And as you've learned by watching this show, Bitcoin is the single most important asset you can own in the 21st century. And one of the most important companies in Bitcoin today is Nidig. Nidig's mission is to facilitate financial security for all. They accomplish this by bringing a high level of professionalization and sophistication to the Bitcoin marketplace. As a true game changer in the industry, Nidig is safely unlocking the power of Bitcoin for forward-thinking individuals and institutions alike. By using Nidig, you will gain access to an end-to-end -end institutional-grade platform, providing Bitcoin OTC transactions, Bitcoin collateralized borrowing, secure custody, asset management, derivatives, financing, market research, and more. And all of these services meet the highest regulatory, governance, and audit standards. Led by Robbie Gutman, Yin Zhao, and Ross Stevens, Nidig has absolutely exploded onto the Bitcoin scene recently and is leading the way for ongoing institutional adoption in this nascent asset class. So please be sure to check out Nidig as a single source for all your Bitcoin needs. Welcome back, guys, to the What Is Money show. I am sitting down today with Mr. Alex Epstein, who is the author of a very interesting book called The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels. Probably not something you've heard about yet, um, but I think the arguments he makes in his books are very compelling and very interesting. So, Alex, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. I was just telling you offline um, how I tend to go for first principle explorations of topics on my show. And um, you, were, you were tapping into that, that topic, and I thought maybe that would be a great place to start is this idea of first principles and maybe a different way um, to look at it or explain it. So clearly we're going to be talking a lot about energy today, which is something very mm -hmm. fundamental to the universe. Um, so maybe we could talk about how we're going to talk about it <laughs> to start. Yeah. So um, just, I was mentioning when we were talking before, just uh, the term first principles, I think a lot of very well-intentioned people and often very smart people use that term, but and it's 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 designed to get to clarity, but I think there's a lot of ambiguity with that term. Like, what do you mean by first principles? Because sometimes what people mean is they mean like the fundamental of something. Like, you know, let's say it's a like I would regard, uh, you know, individual rights as like a fundamental discovery in the realm of politics. But I think of it as it's so I think of it as fundamental, but it's not primary. Like primary means like the starting point that you begin with. And I think individual rights historically took thousands of years for people to figure out. So it's not really primary, but it's, so you could call it like a first principle, but it's sort of something that's, that's at the root of things, but it's not like really the first thing. So primary means, you know, literally first, whereas something like an axiom. So I come from an objectivist philosophical background. So mm. for instance, like in objectivism, there's an idea of there are three basic axioms that are at the base of, that are at the root of all knowledge and they're called existence identity and consciousness and the basic idea is that any claim to knowledge that you make uh any knowledge at all whether it's implicit explicit it's always assuming that there's a world that exists that it has identity that it is it has a specific uh identity and nature and then that you are aware of it and so mm. the part of the idea there is that that you cannot get behind those. Those are the first things. Like anything you say, like you see something, you hear something, there's always existence. It's always a specific form of existence that has an identity. And then you're um, aware of it. So when, I, when, I'm t when we're talking about first principles and like fundamentals, I just like to make a distinction between sort of what is really at the start of thought and then what is sort of, of deep. And then there's a third, at least a third category, which we'll probably talk about with energy, which is like, what's your starting point in a given domain? So mm. there's a whole issue in philosophy of what's the starting point of all knowledge. But mm. then when we go to energy, what's, what's our starting point um, there? And I think a good place, you know, one good place to start there would be what are our assumptions about the relationship between human beings and the rest of nature, particularly what are our causal assumptions? So I, I draw a distinction between two views, one that I think is pervasive and wrong, 
and one that I think is not nearly well known enough, but right. So the pervasive and wrong view, I call the delicate nurturer premise. Mm. And so this is, this is, I think, the way people, when they're talking about climate and they're really afraid of climate and they're afraid of destroying our environment, destroying the planet, there's this element of the delicate nurture, which is to say that nature exists in a delicate nurturing balance. And it usually has three attributes. It's stable, it's sufficient, so it gives us what we need, and it's safe. And you often hear, you see this in Disney movies, but you also see this among academics, the idea of like a nurturing earth that's in a balance that, that our impact destroys. And so the idea of the delicate nurture is always that if we impact the earth, it's going to go haywire. And you can see this, we'll probably talk some about the many catastrophe predictions associated with fossil fuels, but also beyond fossil fuels, like, oh, there's going to be catastrophic depletion, catastrophic pollution, catastrophic global cooling, catastrophic global warming. Not just that those will exist, but that they will be overwhelming catastrophes. And I believe that's ultimately based on this delicate nurturer idea. And in general, when you see very wrong predictions by very smart people, one thing you can guess is that there's a very false assumption that they have in common. And so I think that's something there versus I would take my own causal assumption about how the relationship between human beings and nature, I call it the wild potential premise, which is to say that nature is wild potential. It is naturally dynamic. It's naturally deficient. It's naturally dangerous. And human beings need to very significantly but intelligently impact it to survive and flourish. That's an example of, you could call that a first principle, uh, but I really think of that as like a fundamental truth, but it's one that you that is very relevant uh, in energy. And so that's just one example. The other category I won't go into now is there's a question of what's your goal. And I would just mm -hmm. say there, there's a big distinction I draw between is your goal to, on the one hand, eliminate human impact on earth, which I think is the dominant moral goal and the wrong goal in energy versus do you want to advance human flourishing on earth, which is my goal. And I think that that, right. it, like that assumption and that goal, I actually believe that that explains 90% of disagreement about energy. I actually think it has very little to do with the actual facts. I think it's actually those two elements which constitute a framework, which then determine how we process the facts. Right. Interesting. So the, so I guess the fundamental divergence then is is it morally right to pursue what is best for humans or what is, I guess, perceived to be less least disturbing to nature or least transforming of nature? That's where you see yes. this thing diverging at, at the root. Yeah, I mean, it's, and so the, the human one is clear. It's like, okay, we want to benefit humans and we should be clear this doesn't mean this doesn't mean you're adversarial. So it doesn't mean you want to turn everything to a parking lot. Like you want to do it in a way you want to, you want a, you can think of it as a relationship. Like you yes. want the most pro human relationship right. with the rest of nature. So yeah. like I, you know, before this meeting, I'm worried that I have sand on my face because I go take a nap on the beach every day. And it's like, I don't hate the beach, right? The beach is not by enemy. I love the beach, but I'm interacting with it in a pro human way. I'm not leaving it undisturbed yes. of my body. Yes. I'm, and I'm, I'm encouraging the people who built the road to it that enabled me to get to it. So right. there's that that kind of thing. The the issue though of eliminating human impact, that one is a little trickier to understand because I think it's ultimately very corrupt. Because the the benevolent version of thinking of it is, oh, I just really like nature. Like you think, oh, like I went yeah. to the Grand Canyon once and that felt really nice, and yes. like, oh, I love the beach and stuff. Um, but a to enjoy that you have to massively impact nature. Like to, to enjoy nature, you have to massively, to enjoy parts of it, you have to undisturb, so to speak. You have to massively right. impact almost all of it. Uh, so there's that, but also when you say like you don't want to impact nature, who is that for? Like who's benefiting from right. it? Right. And what you get to is if you say, I'm against human impact, which is a really common view, like being green means eliminating our impact, minimizing our impact it really doesn't benefit anyone and any other species in particular. It just means that we're not doing it. Cause you think like, right. for example, like my impact benefits my dog a lot 
And in general, we can talk about like human impact on the planet benefits a lot of plants because CO2 in the atmosphere leads to more plants growing. And then you can stipulate, okay, well, it hurts other things. Like, so it helps certain things and it hurts other things. Right. So are people really doing some sort of nature-based utilitarian calculus, which I would disapprove of anyway, morally, because mm -hmm. I place primacy on humans, yeah. but they're not really doing that. The view is really that it's just wrong because we did it. And so right. that's that's where it, it's really a deeply anti-human view. And, and I have a term for describing that that people don't like, uh, but, which is, but I think it's very accurate, it's called human racism. And it's the idea that <laughs> anything the human race does is bad and anything yeah. the rest of nature does is, is good. So that's, right. it's really this view of eliminating human impact. The more you really look at it, the more it is not something you want to be a part of, particularly if you understand the human flourishing view allows you to really enjoy nature. Like everything good, the human flourishing view encompasses. Right. And the eliminating human impact view is ultimately like a deep hatred or opposition to humans. And I think most people advocating it or supporting it don't realize that. I think it's disguised. And, and the quick version is it's dis the two ways it's disguised are one, the delicate nurture premise disguises it because it makes us think that, oh, if we don't impact nature, nature is going to be nice to us. And it mm -hmm. also makes us think if we do impact nature, there's going to be a catastrophe. So that's mm -hmm. one way that it's, it's, it's disguised as pro-human. And then the other is, I indicated before, it's bundled together with the idea of a safe and healthy, beautiful environment. So when people mm -hmm. think about, oh, let's eliminate our impact, they think, oh, that means we're just eliminating pollution or you know unnecessary right. destruction of beauty. But it's not about that at all. And in fact, having little pollution and waste, that actually requires a lot of impact. Nature is very polluted from a human perspective. It's very dirty and dangerous. And enjoying mm -hmm. nature is a, a modern phenomenon for the most yes. part of modern civilization. So, but it, but see, it's it's so it's an anti-human view, but it's very cleverly disguised through spreading this false assumption about how the world works that impact is is actually self-destructive. And then by bundling the idea of an unimpacted environment with the idea of a good environment when they're yes. actually polar opposites. It's funny. So this, this moral camouflaging, if you will, it calls mm -hmm. to mind the nature of Marxism, right? Where they had this from each according to their ability to each according to their need. Sounds like a beautiful utopian way to structure society. But as we know from the 20th century, it leads to its precise opposite. So and I actually don't agree. I actually don't agree with that. I, okay. I, I love, I, I like, and I, well, let me say what I don't agree with, because I agree with some of it. Yeah. Um, and I, I do agree that Mark, that many, that this kind of moral camouflaging is very, very uh, prevalent. And we can mm -hmm. think of lots of examples of it. I'll just give a couple of examples that we don't need to go into, but just so people know. And Ayn Rand, by the way, has an amazing essay called Extremism and the Art of uh, extremism, I think, or the art of smearing. Okay. And what she introduces is this thing, what she calls it the intellectual package deal, which is that you use a term that packages together two things that are very different. And it's basically to get you to associate good with bad and bad mm -hmm. with good. So with what I was just talking about, when people talk about, say, the planet, mm -hmm. they're not clear whether they mean an unimpacted planet or a livable planet. Mm. And like, so they, they basically they make you think an unimpacted planet is a livable planet and it's not. Mm. So in example, she gives like the term isolationism is one like isolationism versus engagement. And her view is isolationism is not a coherent kind of idea. Like you don't isolate yourself or engage yourself. In her view, you have a foreign policy that's patriotic, that's actually in your self-interest. So sometimes you stay isolated Sometimes mm -hmm. you engage depending on whether it's in your interest. So if like making all Iraqis into Republicans, which I think was a lot of the goal of the Iraq war, like that would not be a rational goal, but it's not because your isolation is, it's just because you're non-sacrificial. So in that essay, mm -hmm. she talks about, but it's interesting where people came up with the term isolationism to get the US into unnecessary wars because they mm -hmm. wanted to, to caricature anyone who was against wars that weren't in the US's interests as against all foreign policy interaction. Instead of saying, oh, you guys are in favor of a self-interested policy, we're in favor of a self-sacrificial policy. If you put it that way, everyone would be in favor of self-interest. But if you put it as, oh, you need your isolationism versus engagement, people think, oh, I don't want to be isolationism. So now we got to get into all these uh, wars. And so mm -hmm. it's, it's just really interesting how coming up with one of these vague terms that blends together two different things gets you to associate like good with bad or bad with uh, or bad with good. So if we go to Marxism, though, um, you know, and specifically communism, 
so what's interesting about the idea from each according to his ability to each according to his need, and there, there's a brilliant chapter of Atlas Shrugged, uh, which is Ayn Rand's most famous novel, most philosophical novel about this. Her view is, and I agree with this, is that if you really look at what that means from each according to his ability to each according to this, his need, what that means is that the productive gets sacrificed to the unproductive. Mm -hmm. And that is very unappealing. Mm -hmm. Like that's very unappealing. I think if you have a consistently pro-human and individualist perspective that you really think each individual's life should matter to them. They only have one life. It really matters, that kind of thing. Like you think about, oh, does Steve, should Steve Jobs be sacrificed? Like, should his life be at the mercy of the most miserable loser on earth? Like, to me, that's not appealing uh, at all. So that's where I disagree. But where I, but see, I, I agree in another sense because it is placed as appealing, but I think because the idea of self-sacrifice has been camouflaged to mean mm -hmm. like, oh, being nice to people or being concerned about people. So when you think about it from each according to his ability to each according to his need, you think about, oh yeah, it's kind of like being charitable. You know, like you're mm -hmm. doing really well and your neighbor's house burns down and you all pitch in to help them. It has that kind of imagery, yes. but that's not what it really means. Right, and right, right. So, so that's where it's like, but because people have a, a, another kind of package deal is self interest like the way self-interest self-interest, rational self-interest, like where you are pursuing your own interest in harmony with others, that has been packaged together with like being an Al Capone or an Adolf Hitler under like the vague idea of selfishness. Uh, you know, but it's like, so selfishness has become a bad package deal. And so people think, oh, if you're pursuing your interest, you are, you are a bad person. Right. And so, but what it doesn't do is it doesn't distinguish between what Ayn Rand called the creator. So the person who creates value and then enjoys it with the second hander, which is some one one version of that is somebody who who sacrifices, who doesn't create, and who sacrifices creators uh, to themselves. So I think if you if you start looking at the world consistently in terms of like creators versus you could call it exploiters, yeah, like then the idea from each according to his ability to each according to his need doesn't like it becomes very unappealing. But I agree right. to most people it is very appealing because they've been so muddied on these other issues. Yeah, that's I think the first level analysis of that phrase is what I was getting at. And that it's, if you don't think about it, it sounds very appealing on the surface, just mm -hmm. like this concept of undisturbed nature. Like mm -hmm. we all love to go out into the Grand Canyon and observe and look how beautiful and unscathed and pristine it is. Right. But that does not take into account the truth that I think in your book, you named the amount of machine calories. Is that what they were called? Yeah, that, that each human basically enjoys. Uh, you know, you have to tell me the number. The average Even American the, has the U.S. has like two hundred thousand. So machine calories. That's just how I think of energy. So, so basically, it, so like, it's equivalent to like each person having a. I don't want to uh, a slave force behind them, effectively, right? Yeah, of a hundred of a hundred people. A hundred, exactly. So, hundred machine servants. The fact that you get to go into the Grand Canyon and observe pristine, undisturbed nature and enjoy it is supported by this hundred invisible people behind you that put you in the car and you know you had the house you had the food you had the drive the drive through food on the way whatever there's this right. um exploitation is maybe a bad word but we are transforming nature uh in a way that makes us more productive and allows us to even have the concept of enjoying nature as a luxury yes but it seems like people confuse that right they're like oh the whole world should just be totally undisturbed nature because i enjoy this here but if you have right. totally undisturbed nature you have no economization you have no energy force behind you um yeah exactly so yeah that's why i think but you people can, just it's a oh sorry it's like the del the delicate nurture so i mentioned that in general this idea mm -hmm. and you can see it like Right now, I, I live in California, and so you know wildfires are even a bigger topic here than they are nationally. And pretty much any time there's any adverse climate thing nationally, that is now the media's favorite topic. But if yeah. you look at like the, the wildfire thing is a very clear example of delicate nurture premise, because basically the narrative is now we've we added CO2 to the atmosphere, and like we've screwed it up so badly that wildfires are just overwhelming. Like there's nothing we can do about it. It's just, just, we kind of have to suffer and then we got to implement a green new deal. And then like at some point in the future, it'll be cured, which 
mm-hmm. nobody believes in terms of there's no way of lowering CO2 emissions for the or levels re- rather for the foreseeable future. So it's has this very defeatist element, which is part right. of what I think is dishonest about it. But but uh, in any case, what we can see is there is this idea of the delicate nurture, right? We screwed up nature. Nature is punishing us and there's nothing we can do about it. Whereas if you look at just wildfires, I mean, you think, come on, we can't do anything about out of control wildfires. There's a hell of a lot you can do. I mean, one thing you can do is you can build barriers. Like if you mm-hmm. have one section, of, like you can separate the forest in different ways if you want to. Mm-hmm. You can log the forest, which is what you used to do. And speaking of economization, it's incredibly hard to manage a forest if you're not allowed to generate any value out of it. People mm-hmm. don't value visiting random forests all that much, so they don't pay for it. So that's yep. a big reason why. And if we don't allow logging, then we just have this enormous environmental hazard. And then there's what they call controlled burns. And really, if you look at the facts of it, even if climate changed much more dramatically than it has, we could totally master dangerous wildfires compared to how dangerous they used to be. But this delicate nurture premise applied to wildfires makes people think, oh, we angered nature and we're screwed. And therefore, like, you know, there's nothing we can do about it. But it, right. it, you notice it also has this moral element of we eliminating impact. We shouldn't have been impacting nature in the first place. We did the wrong thing. And you'll notice these always go together, the idea of you did the wrong thing, and then you have this assumption that you get punished for doing the wrong thing. And right. you, know, you see this in every religion. It's like if you do the wrong thing, then the God in the religion punishes you. And this is why this has a very religious quality to it, this whole yeah. anti-human impact movement, which is we angered nature, and now nature is punishing us. Whereas from a scientific viewpoint, you think, okay, you put more CO2 in the atmosphere, more plants are going to grow. It's going to be somewhat warmer. That's probably good in some ways, probably bad in some ways. Like you don't have at all this narrative of it's a hell, particularly if you mm-hmm. learn, oh, wait, the earth used to be 25 degrees warmer than it is now. <clears throat> and CO2 levels used to be way higher. And sometimes they were a lot higher and it wasn't even that much warmer. Like there's nothing to justify this like hell narrative, mm-hmm. except for this kind of religious perspective. And then this, this idea that it's wrong to impact nature. And then it must be self-destructive because nature is a delicate nurturer. So is the root of this then is a form of ignorance transforming itself into what sounds like a branch of nihilism in a way, where people just start to look at people as this virus or cancer on the planet that needs to be reduced and or eradicated. Is that what you're saying? So what was the first part? I, I liked your use of the word nihilism and I got stuck on that. So what, what was the, <laughs> it just what was the seems said to be, be, that's a good term. Um, I guess the, the, this original, misunderstanding or ignorance where it's like we need to interact with nature less would seem to be Mm -hmm. somehow the morally right thing right leads down this path of a nihilistic uh, anti-human viewpoint as you call it i think right so there's a so this is another interest of like if you're asking first kind of like what's at the root of it versus Mm -hmm. sort of chronologically what happened and i think they're they're a little different so i think at the root of it there the ideas i'm mentioning in terms of you know the goal of eliminating human impact and then the assumption that nature is a delicate nurture mm-hmm. but then there's a real question of how did those how and why did those penetrate the culture and one thing to observe so and i regard both of these as very both of these are very primitive uh ideas they particularly delicate nurture has the association with science but i think that's that's very undeserved it's much more mm-hmm. it undermines science it's not at all science discovered this and the history of it it bears out as like philosopher type people who came up with it. Mm-hmm. But it's interesting if you look at the like early 1900s, late 1800s, it, they had much more my view, which I, I call the human flourishing framework. So the idea, the goal is to advance human flourishing mm-hmm. and that nature's wild potential. And so part of advancing human flourishing is, is intelligently impacting nature or productively impacting nature on a massive scale. But it, it very much, and it was also part of the left, you know, believed this. I mean, I, I have no love for the early 20th century left because they promoted uh, communism, which we were talking about before. Mm-hmm. And they really you know, destroyed huge amounts of, of humanity with that. But at least it had a pro-human veneer, like even to each according his, you know, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. At least humans are supposed yeah, to, some humans right. are supposed to benefit. Human Whereas centered. with this, it's like, we're not supposed to benefit uh, at all. And so an interesting thing, and this is, I, I've made a couple of references to Ayn Rand, whom I think is just, I think one yes. of my advantages that I have is that I've studied her seriously and most people haven't. So I right. think she just has all these insights that most people don't learn. They often hear secondhand like attacks that are usually inaccurate. But so one point she has this really good book that she published during her life called The New Left, 
which was explaining this development, like the development of this anti-impact perspective as it was emerging. And she documented at the time that what was happening was the political left, but you can think of it as like the anti-capitalist faction. They had previously pretended to be pro-human, pro-industry, pro-prosperity. Mm. She viewed it as pretending. They at least assumed Generously, they assumed it would lead to these things. Mm -hmm. And then it clearly led to the destruction of these things, particularly in the wake of World War II, you could see how destructive it was. Mm -hmm. And her view was, well, the anti-capitalists had a decision to make. They could either embrace capitalism if what they really valued was prosperity, industry, progress. Like if Mm -hmm. they valued that, then they needed to embrace capitalism or they could reject prosperity, industry, and progress. And that's what they did with right. the environmental movement. And in the wake, and it was an explicit strategy in the wake of the Vietnam War to, to need a new way to attack American capitalism, which the Vietnam War was seen as signifying, which isn't really accurate, but they had they needed a cause post-Vietnam and it was very deliberate, let's make it about what they would call the environment. Mm. And that was it, was, it was a very deliberate strategy. And what one reason it was so effective is that the, the pro-capitalism side was pretty bad at talking about that and embracing it. It's right. you really think about who owns, who should own the value of a good livable environment, except for the people in favor of property rights. That's yes. the only way of a good environment right. at all. Yes. Um, but they didn't really do that. And so the anti-capitalist side got to own the issue of like the good issues of environment, like clean air, clean water, natural beauty, mm-hmm. things like that. And so that got falsely, got falsely packaged with anti-capitalism mm, and capitalism got seen as like anti those parts right. uh, of environment. And so then it, it was this really, I mean, there's a lot more to say, but I'll just wrap it up as, you know, once you, once you infiltrate the political system, like once a certain quest infiltrates the political system, because the state controls the realm of ideas, particularly, you know, it funds basically all science, almost all science yeah. and education, People, that people just think of it as, oh, it's just generosity. Oh, thanks, government, for giving us money. But it's really control because they get to decide what ideas are valid to pursue and disseminate and what aren't. Right. So the more this political movement to sort of attack capitalism on environmental grounds gains traction, the more it gets just totally blasted through the educational system. So I, I was mm. born in 1980, and I was on the earlier side of, of receiving this where you're just being taught, hey, capitalism is destroying the planet. Capitalism is destroying the planet. So you get totally inculcated delicate nurture. You get totally inculcated that we should be reducing our impact. And and you get all of these quote unquote facts uh, Mm -hmm. about it. Just like if you look at the media, you would think today, we have never been more in danger from wildfires. Like even adults think this, like they really think wildfires are more dangerous than ever. And they're not at all. Now they could be much less dangerous if we didn't have these terrible forest policies, but they're still nowhere near the danger they used to be. But you imagine what that's doing to kids, like five, six, seven years old, you're being brought up in this world that tells you, yeah, the world was like a garden of Eden until we screwed it up. And we're going to cause an apocalypse. And you have it to the point where you have young kids who are super, super afraid. So that's kind of how this very obscure and wrong perspective was sort of to the political advantage of somebody. And then they just totally blasted it throughout the realm of ideas. And then it just permeates journalism. It permeates, you know, permeates all the knowledge institutions in society. And so it's this weird thing where all these smart people are like functionally very dumb. Like they can't. They can't think of these things in a pro-human way. So the, the originally then capitalism almost having bad PR in a way because it gave the anti-capitalistic yeah. mo- movement to the opportunity to say this is the answer to pollution and all these other things. When in fact, I think many Austrian economists, you know, Rothbardians would argue it's actually the preservation, and probably Ayn Rand as well, the preservation of private property rights is the only way we can keep the environment clean and livable, right? Like if, yeah, you're, and, and, if you're dumping yeah, pollution in my I, river and I can sue you, that's how that cost gets infused into that operation and makes its cost benefit not work out such that the polluting, the river polluting uh, operation would be disbanded. Right. So it's, it's the, um, so there's some interesting differences there among the thinkers, but I think the key idea here is yes, the, you need to define property rights. Mm-hmm. And in general, the like, there's the whole issue, which is probably not worth getting into. But if you look at like a lot of modern economists, they tend to be 
unadmitted philosophical utilitarians, Mm -hmm. which basically means they think that everybody should be sacrificed to everybody for some like collective good right? versus the more individual rights perspective is which the government exists to protect uh, the individual and to, and, and like in the aggregate, yeah, that adds up, but the aggregate isn't a real thing. It's not right. like it's not like a moral thing. It's just the aggregate uh, of individuals. And it's so another camouflaging, with- perhaps this because Rothbard talks a lot about this as elusive society that doesn't actually exist. It's the culmination of individuals. Well, yeah, I mean, so camouflage like there are a lot of things that get camouflaged. So let's see with society. I mean, definitely society gets it gets deified. Mm. So but it gets made into a kind of God. And and definitely, yeah. So one one. Yeah, that's a good point. So one example would be often it's society or the public good. And what it's really means is that some individuals get sacrificed to others. Mm. But if you put it that way, it doesn't right. sound so good. So yeah. if you put it as like, oh, the good of the people, like yeah. what does that mean? Because when, right. when you look at it, it, it doesn't just mean the sacrifice of some to others. It means the unjust sacrifice because it invariably means the productive gets sacrificed to the unproductive, because you leave right. people free, the productive will interact with each other generally in proportion to their productivity. So it really means systematic injustice. And one of the great things about, say, Atlas Shrugged is it it's a novel that really dramatizes this. And so when you read Atlas Shrugged, when you're in that world, you think all this stuff in favor of society is terrible yeah, because it's just sacrificing these innocent, good people. And it really dramatizes, oh, who are the people who are demanding these sacrifices? There are people mm-hmm. who are sort of demanding them and there are people who are um, who are executing them, like the mm-hmm. bureaucrats, and and those neither of those groups are viewed highly. Now there are also like innocent people whom they're done on behalf of, and you, you see this with every issue where most of the supposed beneficiaries of sacrifices don't even want them, mm-hmm. and certainly mm-hmm. don't benefit from them. But there are certain people who do want them, unearned, and that's wrong. And then yeah. there are certain people who want to be who want to execute the sacrifices. They want the power. Yeah. And they want the unearned status of, okay, Steve Jobs created this wealth, but you're actually better than Steve Jobs because you get to steal his money and give right. it to somebody else, right. but it's all for society. And so yes. in that sense, it's it sounds, it's like packaging together what's good about society, which is mutually beneficial interaction on a large scale. Yeah. But it's like packaging that with, with just completely unjust sacrifice of the productive to the unproductive. And the goal, the goal of these packages is always put over the bad thing. So it's really to put over the unjust sacrifice of the productive to the unproductive by associating it. So you're exactly right now that I think about it by associating it with all the good things that we get from voluntary, mutually beneficial right. interaction. Yeah. So maybe this is a point of connection then this, what you described as Ayn Rand describing as the creators versus the extractors or. Maybe- it is, there's a broader, she has two, like one is the creator and the second hander. The second hander though, can be an exploiter right. or they can be a sacrificer. So they can either sacrifice others to themselves or they can sacrifice themselves to others. So there's sort of three, but for our purposes, yeah. if we're talking about self-interest, you could think of it as like the creator versus the exploiter. Got it. Creator versus exploiter, which Rothbard designates, um, People as being in two distinct groups, which is on a net basis, taxpayers, right? Mm-hmm. Which are the creators or the productive people. And on a net basis, the tax consumers, the ones that benefit mm-hmm. from the proceeds, the stolen proceeds from the creators. I guess you'd call them the exploiters or the extractors. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, hard when you put it in terms of taxes, though, because it's like, does there are all sorts of? I mean, also there's taxes and there's also controls, and controls mm-hmm. are arguably much more destructive than the taxes. But so you can think of it's hard to classify anybody like oh they're sometimes put as like a maker or a taker. Yeah, right. Yeah, maker, it's hard taker. to do that in like an aggregate sense because you just you just take somebody. Okay, let's say somebody's like on welfare, but they were sort of like you know, their parent couldn't afford school because the government took away their money and they had to go to this terrible government school that screwed them. So like their maker, there's a, the one of the problems with, you know, what's called the mixed economy, which is this mixture of freedom and controls, is that there's just this continuous, sa- like undifferentiated sacrifice. And mm. it's so hard to tell. And you take someone I admire a lot in a lot of ways, like, like Jeff Bezos, 
okay, so he is like creating enormous amounts of wealth, but then he's also pushing for a $15 minimum wage that totally screws mm. young people who yeah. want to do something. Or he's financing all these climate nonprofits that I believe are destroying, trying to destroy our energy system. So it's like, he's a hero in some ways to me. Right. And then, so it's like the real thing is you need to get government out of economics, like yes. economic ideas should be pursued by individuals voluntarily. And I, I right. do believe this extends to money as well. Yes. And when, when you coerce people, then it's all, so the whole, I, you know, the whole just monetary system in terms of inflation is a perfect example where you just, it's like a form of theft from some people, but it can be really hard to know even who's been screwed and who's benefited. Right. Yes. Yeah, so agreed on all counts, it's probably very difficult to determine who is what of each group, but I think mm -hmm. just rationally, that's how it operates. And I know it shifts around, like someone may be a taxpayer one year, a tax consumer the next, et cetera. But the, and what you just touched on, I think is the key point is that you need coercion and compulsion out of the economy, which means you need government out of the economy. And the only way to get government out of the economy, in my opinion, is to get them out of the money. Right, so long as they can monopolize. Yeah, that would be that would be great. I mean, I'm very, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, so I'm not super knowledgeable. About, I liked your thread about Bitcoin. I'm very, like, I'm my view of Bitcoin is I'm very, like, philosophically in favor of it. Mm -hmm. So I'm just very philosophically in favor of freedom of currency. Right, and, and it's the same reason for, and that you know, one parallel between energy and currency that maybe uh, viewers will appreciate is they're both fundamentals. So they're both at the the base. Of things, so you can think yes. of like finance and 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 energy as the two fundamental industries. So yeah. energy is the industry that powers every other industry because yeah. every industry uses machines, and energy is what powers the machines, including the machines that all the hundreds and thousands of machines that produce every machine. So like you you play with the cost if you make energy more cost effective, so it's lower cost, more reliable, more versatile, larger scale. Like you make everything more productive, right, and thus affordable for everybody and more people have more capabilities. And if you make energy less cost effective, so it gets more expensive, less reliable, less versatile, short, a smaller scale, then everything gets worse. And so right. it has that like fundamental uh, character and, and, and money, it has this in a bunch of ways. Like it has it in the context of investment, like where money goes, like if money goes, you know, really resources go to their most productive use, that obviously has huge it has benefits to the extent that happens and to the extent it goes to destruction, you could destroy a whole society. Uh, right. in a generation if you if you misallocated capital so much. So it's it's yes. you know I'm very and so those are you know those are realms in which particularly money it's totally taken for granted the government should control it. But the more fundamental the realm, the more you should be afraid of coercion deciding things because there's no way that that you know it can be decided rationally. If yes. it's one coercive person. And the other realm I would just add to this is ideas. Mm -hmm. It's very much taken for granted that, as I mentioned before, it's a good thing for the government to control education. It's usually put as, oh, we're going to be generous. Of course, it's yeah. taking people's money, but we're going to be course. generous with this. Like, oh, we're going to fund all this great school and all these great science uh, research. And, and isn't that fantastic? But it really just means we're going to control it. And so you really are having people with guns controlling what research gets right. done, what research doesn't get done, what gets taught. So it's it's this unbelievable lever that yeah. I don't think, you know, our founding fathers could have ever imagined that degree of control where, again, some people who wanted a way to attack capitalism after the Vietnam War, like in my view, brainwashed almost everyone right. through this allegedly beneficent mechan uh, mechanism of free school and free science. Absolutely. Um I don't know if you've read much Mises, uh, his book. Uh, human quite a, much, much more than most people, I think. Also, I, so you, you read Human Action? Yeah, well, I read I read a bunch of it. I mean, Human Action really. So I, I've read, um, I read more of Rothbard. I actually like Mises quite a bit more for a bunch of reasons probably aren't worth getting into. But I, I uh, yeah, just reading Human Action, I mean, the biggest takeaway from that is a pretty simple thing for Austrians, but it's, it's, just the idea, like, and I forget if he even used this example, but it's stuck with me uh, ever since, which is that just the idea that you can, you can be physically building stuff and it's actually destructive. So mm -hmm. you think of like, it's an example of a principle, but you think of like, okay, we built a building yes. and, you, and people think like, 
on a kind of labor theory of value. Oh, we just, we just, I think that's what it is in this case. Uh, you know, we just like, oh, we, I did some work, right? I put together these bricks and I did this. And, but it could be that that building is less valuable than the sum of the bricks, right? right? And the sum of the resources. And it could also be, so it could be net destructive or it could be uneconomic. It could be there was an opportunity cost. Right. And so this was a lot less productive than the other things. And it, it just is this, like you realize, oh wait, value, you can't just think of value as just like, it's just physical stuff. It's ultimately right. about people's evaluations of it to their yes. life. And, and Mises and Austrians would call this subjective value and, and yeah. objectivists would call this, we call it socially objective value, but it's getting at the same thing, which is recognizing that value is in a very real way in the valuer. Right. And it's right, right. And, and and that, yeah, I mean, you know all the stuff about how that translates into well, it's like it's like so beauty, right? You know, value is <laughs> in, the, in the eye of the beholder in a way. And to that, it's funny you brought up that point because that of that huge 1200 page book, my main takeaway from human action was very similar to that point in that all government action is a misallocation of capital because they're ultimately distorting this voting mechanism that the free market is, right? It represents mm -hmm. consumer demand expressing itself through buying and selling decisions. If you have any course of action introduced to that system or process, it is necessarily withdrawing productive factors that consumers would otherwise allocate towards something else and putting it into this government determined aim or end. So my big takeaway was like, all, co all government is coercive. Right. Well, yeah, but so then, then you get into you know another set of debates, which is you know even if you look at Mises versus uh, Rothbard. So Mises is pro government. I mean, he's pro government protecting individual rights, and and uh, which I am. And then uh, you know Rothbard is anti government. So this whole issue of like you know what what's the role of government? And so I think you need to. But in any case, it's the what I would stress is just the realm of economics. It's like it's an interesting thing because it's in my view it's. It's a really important thing to study these interactions among individuals and sort of how they aggregate, but I, I still maintain it's really about the individuals. And I think often when mm -hmm. people talk about these aggregates, they think that optimizing these aggregates is some sort of end in itself, mm -hmm. whereas it's really a means for individuals pursuing their own end. So you think about something like, oh, a person, you know, a person, uh, let's say a beach near me, you know, a person has a house and they could sell the house in a certain way and make a hotel and it could create billions of dollars, but they just love that house for themselves. So an economist could, who's a kind of, particularly if there's a utilitarian element, they could say, we should get rid of that, kick that person off, right? Who cares right. about them? A thousand people could be happy. And I don't think of it that way at all. I think of it yeah. as they created this value, they get to enjoy it. And so I, I'm, I'm in favor of economics, but it's, it's, it's ultimately about individuals it's it's really about individuals pursuing their own lives, and that's why you know the the role of government, but more broadly the protection of rights, is such a crucial issue. Like, how do you define those? And so, I do think when the government goes beyond the protection of rights, I do agree that economically it is it is distorting what the proper price would be. Right. But I, it's almost tautological because I think the proper price is the price that free individuals would choose. Right. Which is different from. Uh, it, it's it, that which is different from, but not unrelated to, sort of the theoretically most efficient thing. And and even even if you recognize that all value is is um, what you would call subjective, but if you recognize it's sort of in the value, or you can still say like, oh, this person made a mistake. And on individual rights, the idea is they have a right to make a mistake. So you could yeah. say like, oh, you want to be a doctor, and you decided to go to this medical school. And then, and and I knew that was the wrong medical school. If you wanted to be a doctor, like you still don't get a right to tell that person what medical school uh, to go to. So I just I'm always just sensitive to when we talk about economics, like not ever putting it above the what you I I heard you on Lex Friedman like talking about the individual sovereignty, which is a concept uh -huh. I like a lot. So like the government doesn't the government is there to protect the individual sovereignty. It's yeah. not there to optimize the individual right. sovereignty, let alone the collective sovereignty. Yeah, I agree. So I think maybe this is where the three, I'm, I'm thinking Rothbard, Mises, Ayn Rand may conjoin actually, is that it, I believe Ayn Rand says this, that property rights are the basis of all rights. Like you need yeah, to the have- The implementation really. That's like the, the, the main implementation of all rights. And that would be governments 
that is the purpose of government, basically, is the preservation of property rights. I mean, if you include yes. life and liberty within property, which they are in a way, you know, your own time, your own livelihood is your own property in the, the concept of self ownership. I mean, you're protecting all these rights physically. I think that's why she says it's like the implementation. So the idea yes. is, the idea is the, uh, just very quickly, it's like her view is so, but, you know, difference among them, and she's much more different than I think, I mean, she actually, Rothbard had like actual arguments and conflicts in there their mm-hmm. life. But, and, and Mises, she had some interesting arguments with as well. I mean, they were like friends or at least uh, knew each other, mm-hmm. but you know, her, her view, which I agree with is that your view of government is derivative of your view of morality. Even if mm-hmm. you look at like the term rights, like mm-hmm. right, her definition again, which I agree with was, is like right is a moral principle defining and sanctioning a freedom, an individual's freedom of action in a mm-hmm. social context. So you're like, when you're talking about politics and rights, you're saying it's right. So it, it's based on your view of what is right for the individual and mm-hmm. also what is the nature of the individual. And so her view is the nature of the individual is we are a creative, productive being. We survive using reason and yeah. production. We can exist in a mutually beneficial way. And therefore the proper system is the one that that frees us to act and interact as we judge best. Now, if we were all like ants, that if we had a different nature, we couldn't have that. There wouldn't be the proper political system. And if it was true that our lives don't morally belong to us, then we couldn't have a system with rights. And that's really where she diverges from a lot of people, where a lot of most so-called libertarians, which is they'll say, or at least they used to say, like, it doesn't matter what morality you have, we still have rights and it's still wrong to initiate force. Mm-hmm. And, and my view is that's not, you can't really defend that because ultimately, look, if it's right for somebody to sacrifice themselves and they're not doing it, how can you say that if if it's really wrong at a fundamental level for them to live for themselves, how can you really say, oh, the government shouldn't uh, do anything about it? So I don't think Mises, I don't think Rothbard or Mises would even disagree with the political implications of it, nor would they strongly disagree with her morally. Others Mm -hmm. would, uh, but, but it is a strong emphasis on the morality, including the view of human nature, is at the base of rights, but I agree that, so when she says the right to life, it's really the right to take the type of action that a human life requires. And the two mm-hmm. elements are thinking and production. And mm-hmm. both of those, the way you protect those is ultimately by doing physical things. Like you don't need to do anything to protect my right to think inside my head. Mm-hmm. Like there's nothing you need mm-hmm. to do inside my head or could right. do, but there are things you could do to violate my right to think, including you could tell me, well, you're not allowed to do what you think is right, in which case I won't think of it in the first place. Um, like, So it's ultimately, yeah, that's why property rights are the implementation, because all the ways we protect, protect our liberty to live our lives the best way yeah. is, is all through these physical things, like right to free speech is protected through yes. property rights. And unfortunately, it's not understood at all right now, because we have this ridiculous thing where everyone thinks that they own like they think free speech just means I get to say whatever I feel like, wherever I feel like it, whereas yeah. that means everyone's property. That's like, oh, you have a nice living room and there are a lot of smart people there. So I get to barge in and talk to them. Yeah. Or like, you're not allowed to kick me out if you don't like me. And I'm like, no, that doesn't make. That's not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I agree with you. And then for me, the thing that's where I diverge from Rothbard, um, and I'm not sure what Ayn Rand's perspective on this is that the crux of all this, because it is the physical security so that we can think and have discourse and all these things, that's what matters. So the crux Mm -hmm. of property rights ends up being violence and protection from violence and the nature of Mm -hmm. violence, the economics of violence. And that's why I see something like, like you can never legislate morality. We know that, but what you can do is change the economic incentives related to violence. And this is where, there's a book that I mentioned a lot called The Sovereign Individual, where it mm-hmm. makes the case that having a money like a Bitcoin that's a property right independent of the monopoly on violence. You don't need anyone else's um, exclusive acknowledgement of your property right. You just need the information and you mm-hmm. need the Bitcoin network to exist, right? That's how, that's the mm-hmm. basis for your property right. And because it's informational, you can custody in it custody it in a way that's very difficult to confiscate. So it's very resistant to violence or said differently, Mm -hmm. it makes the cost benefit of violence by the perpetrator much higher, right? If you've got physical gold Mm -hmm. and you're safe, I come in with a gun, I can take the gold. I've got a pretty high return on my coercive act. But if you've got your Bitcoin 
in a multi-signature wallet that's distributed geographically, I can come in and rob you, but I'm probably not going to get your Bitcoin. So it, mm -hmm. it changes the incentives to violence. And I feel like this is where this seems to be like the only way to get government reined in. Like we, you have to get them. I hope not. I hope it's not the only, I mean, I, I like whenever you can do this kind of, I mean, whenever you can create a lot of friction and I would use like coercion or force. My issue with violence is we're too focused on, I mean, I think you're thinking of force as violence. So there's a, there's a good utility to that. But I, I think, unfortunately, we focus too much on violence, which is just what does violence mean? It's just very apparent force in front of us. Mm -hmm. But most coercion is done through threat. Like most of the coercion, yes, right, I, there's no I, I violence should qualify at all. this when I say violence. I mean, also what the government, when the government, the IRS sends you a bill saying pay this or else, that's right. in the shadow of violence. So it's right, kind of right, like right. A, that's, an umbrella term. Right. That's what I think. That's, I just want to clarify for, yeah. for myself that I like it's this you should think of all things, all this, these coercive things, you should really think of it as ultimately this means the physical violence and everything we associate with that. So you take something like I'm focused on right now, there's this thing called what they call euphemistically the clean energy standard, which says the United States has to be has to get 80% of our electricity from quote clean sources mm -hmm. by 2030, which is eight and less than eight and a half years. And and it, uh, if you do the math on that, it means at least has to be at least 50% solar and wind, mm. uh, which for reasons we'll probably get into, I think is an absolute catastrophe. Right now it's 10% and it's huge problems already with cost and reliability. But anyway, this is it's like that is not thought of. Most people aren't very up in arms about that. Like most people, they wouldn't think of that as a violent. Right. And if you know there was a school shooting, they'd be like, "Oh well, that's that's terrible." But this clean energy standard, I mean, that's it's so civilized, and we're having a discussion, or maybe we're not even having a discussion. But like, who cares? Like, we think we're doing the right kind of thing. But like, like really, it means the government gets to dictate how yeah. every single person powers their home and powers their business, and it gets to do so at gunpoint. Right. And. So it's not allowing you to live. I mean, we need electricity to live uh, at any yes. level and certainly to flourish. And so it's just this thing where it seems like it, it's just this. Um, it's actually deadlier, right? The clean. It's much deadlier, right? <laughs> so it's it's the, um, there's a, another, um, there's a book called uh, Objectivism, the Philosophy of Ayn Rand by a guy named Leonard Peikoff, who was kind of her, her main student. Uh, and he taught a course during her life that she said, oh, this is the best course on objectivism because she unfortunately never taught one herself mm. or, or wrote a book on her whole philosophy. Atlas Shrugged is kind of the closest. Um, but he has he just has this line in it that I'll butcher a little bit, but I've always remembered, which is just like, he talks about like the prim little bureaucrat is just as bad as like the gun wielding maniac. Mm, and I've just always thought right. of like, oh yeah, the prim little bureaucrat, like he's skinny. He kind of looks like Adam Silver, you know, the head of the NBA. He has that kind of, look to him and you just think like, oh, that's that person's not bad. And he's just talking and maybe they're laughing yeah, and yeah. they're never saying anything straight. And it's like, no, you can be a killer just as much or more than like a bank robber, you know, or, you know, the kinds of things we associate with violence. Yes. hundred percent. This I had a, a guy on the show recently telling me a story how he had done he was telling it secondhand, but the guy had done business around the world. He had dealt face to face with warlords in Africa and all these different things. And he said he had never been robbed so badly as when he was in California, with, you know, <laughs> smiling people and suits and shaking. There, exactly. um, so I, I, I try to zero in on this because so the purpose of government is to preserve property rights, but by monopolizing the money supply and inflating it, they are directly violating property rights and in a faster in an accelerating way, right? With each economic crisis, we're actually distorting the money supply even further, which is mm -hmm. effectively, effectively them implicitly confiscating people's property and allocating it towards these other arbitrary aims. So, and it seems to me like a lot of those aims are things like this, like this Clean Energy Act or this yes. Green New Deal, you know, again, these morally moralistically camouflaged um, packages of legislation that I don't ever, I forget who told me the rule of legislation, but if you just interpret it as its opposite, that's the best way to actually see what, <laughs> what it actually is the title, to do. That's probably yeah. true. Yeah, exactly. So is there a path? And by the way, you, you brought up money earlier. It's, uh, I had Michael Saylor on and he's actually describing money as the highest form of energy a human can channel. 
because it's a claim on all the other forms of energy we can produce, right? Both our, our labor energy, nuclear energy, whatever form of energy it is, money lays claim to it. Right. In the broadest sense. I mean, you're, you're really claiming their productive ability or the, the fruits yes. of it. Yeah. And so energy is, it's, not, it's, it's like a constant in all ability, right? Like it's what the ability runs on. It's not. Right. So I'm trying, what, what I'm getting at here is like, it doesn't seem possible to disentangle the distortion government is having in the environment without disentangling them also from the money because well, every time, because they're twisting they're it to their favor. Well, I think you can disentangle a lot. And by the way, with environment, I'll just highlight, like, I, I like talking about our environment, not the environment. I think okay. the environment packages together the idea of like a livable environment for humans and then okay. an unimpacted environment. Notice when we usually talk about the environment, it's usually the idea of an unimpacted environment. So that's why if we talk about our environment, it brings in all of our surroundings, whether they're created by humans or not, doesn't really matter. It's right, like everything right, right. that affects gotcha. us. So gotcha. just that uh, if people notice, like I really am in favor of talking about. Like, so like our, our environment, environment would include your home, basically. Of course. So the yeah. environment is just the, the trees and whatnot. Yeah. Gotcha. And you could talk yeah. about like, but, but it's, it's not just the trees. See that, the, the it's like the trees from the perspective of we shouldn't impact them. Right. Like it's the unimpacted. So you could like, I'll use we don't, like outdoors. Like I'll often talk about, you know, the outdoors because that sort of captures, that's not, that's not saying we should impact it or not. It's just mm -hmm. saying, well, here's a different place. Like it's different gotcha. to be inside my house than the outdoors. And you can talk about a forest and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but then I, I just distracted myself from the main question. So you're talking, oh yeah, the disentangling, right? So you have this, I mean, in a sense, Nothing can be disentangled and certainly two very significant phenomena that both deal with fundamentals in a society. So, you know, government involvement in uh, in money and then government involvement in energy in a sense. So they're very entangled. I think the main mechanism, but I, there's a lot we can say without having to figure out everything about money or even without having to change money. Yeah. I think one of the main mechanisms, though, that they are entangled is that almost none of these things could occur were it not for the ability to engage in inflationary spending slash theft. 100%. So you can, you can, you can take like, um, you know, and so, so I, I, I'm just going to stipulate some things and then I can, I can uh, explain them as, as needed, but let's just stipulate that solar and wind are not actually competitive sources of energy on a large scale. And just to yes. stipulate the pieces of evidence for that, they only exist in significant quantities where they're subsidized. Everywhere they're used, they add to the cost of energy. Mm -hmm. There are many claims that they are cheaper, but those claims ignore the full cost of them. The real mm -hmm. mechanism that occurs is they don't really replace reliable power plants. They just are like wasteful additions to mm -hmm. reliable power plants. That's why they add costs. So let's just say, I mean, there's more detail on that, but let's just say it should at least be plausible to people. Yeah, these are, these are cost adding sources of energy that would not be chosen by free people because right. free people don't want to like if you're making you know you're making computers like you don't want to choose more expensive forms of energy if you're mining you don't want to choose more yes. expensive forms of energy which solar wind can't even do mining at all for, right because you need oil you need something really dense and portable free, free people will do economic calculation that is rational in general yeah in general yeah. yeah, in general. And certainly average, nothing yeah. that's wildly irrational right. in like in a very apparent way. Like, yes. oh, you're just paying way more yeah. uh, for everything. But but if you can print money, this isn't news to anyone listening to this, but like if you can print money, look, they'll say, Bernie Sanders will say, oh, like, oh, I've got this plan and it only costs $16 trillion. Right. I don't think people know what a trillion dollars Right. Is. I think it's about yeah. $7,500 a household. Like that's right. a lot. Of, and you think yeah. about the time that that means if you take people's time at like $30 an hour, yeah. what is that like? That's like 300, yeah. Something like 300 hours of their life or 250 hours of their life of each person. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's so staggering at like 16, but, but the way it's thought of is, okay, yeah, we can sort of, yeah, let's just afford that. But what does that mean? It just means like there's it's not even going to be printed, right? It's just going to be just different computer code yeah. saying, okay, now this exists. But that means that the people who spent all the time creating existing money, some way their in some way their money is their time and resources are going away. That's right. And it's going into this this new thing. Yeah. But then the thing is, this new thing it doesn't just kind of cost that money because then you need to use this to produce energy. But it's not any good at producing energy. 
So then it makes everything more expensive later. And they don't factor that into right. the cost. Because again, if you make energy more expensive, you yes. make everything more expensive. So it's it's definitely that. I mean, in general, radically uneconomic things are at least dramatically facilitated by inflation, you know, by, by government inflation and yes. theft. We could we could call it. You see this kind of thing in healthcare as well, but I think it's very clear in energy. But nevertheless, in energy, like even if you don't get those dynamics, I think you can still get that energy can be more or less cost effective. And I, I have four dimensions of cost effective. So cost effective means just you know how valuable is it compared to how much it costs. Mm -hmm. But I think of it as you know what's the cost, what's the reliability. What's the versatility? Like how many different types of machines can the energy mm -hmm. power? And then what's the scalability? Mm -hmm. To what extent can it produce the energy you want for billions mm -hmm. of people in thousands of places? And it's really, it turns out it's really hard to do. Like fossil fuels are 80% of the world's energy, but they're, mm -hmm. they're really unique in terms of cost effectiveness today, particularly with the versatility thing. Like they're mm -hmm. completely dominant for mobility, particularly oil, because it's so... It's so dense and so right. portable, and portability is so important for anything that involves trade, anything that involves mobility, like yeah. things like mining, uh, of course, transportation. And, you know, just the fossil, the energy industry using fossil fuels has just created this unbelievable phenomenon of energy everywhere that's low cost, on demand, every type of machine you can imagine. And it's like I th you really need to think about what would life be like. If we didn't have that, that's one kind of thing to think about. And then what is the evidence that a given alternative can actually replace this? And I think the only evidence you should take is, is real competition. But unfortunately, the way right. discussion works today is you don't have competition. You just have models. So you have people I would regard as cranks. And they mm. just say, oh, I came up with a way. They'll be like, oh, I came up with a way that we can replace all fossil fuels or 80%, let's say, by 2030 in eight and a half years, and it'll be cheaper for everyone. Right. It's like based on a spreadsheet. You could, <laughs> yeah. Like a, and you, with any given spreadsheet, you can show, okay, it's crazy this way. It's crazy this way. But yeah. you don't like in a free, like the first question would be, okay, if that's such a good idea, why can't free people do it? Like, right. why do you need to impose it on us well, instead yes. of, and yes. it's like, okay, yes. well, it's so urgent and stuff. But it's it's really so what you have is this like these crackpot ideas, like th they they have the imprimatur of like rationality, and so you have this like economics instead of being done by free people making rational choices and living or yes. dying by how rational their choices are, you just have these arbitrary academics who couldn't run a Seven Eleven, right? Making like dictating the whole economy, unaccountable. I think the accountability is the oh, key yeah. point here, right? Or they're not incurring the cost of bad decision making where it's the a big, entrepreneur it's a big will. Part of, it's a big. It's a big part of it. I mean, there's there's the in. I mean, there's the inability. It's it's sort of striking. Most of these people don't even have the ability to be the successful proprietor of one small yes. business. Yeah. But then there's just the the immorality and impossibility of of controlling the whole economy. Like, how are you yes. going to know what? Like, think about it. Like, what distribution of resources is going to be is going to most cost effectively produce energy? Yes. In the next 20 years. How the yes. hell could anyone ever right, know that? Right, right, right. It's like, oh yeah, you're gonna know, okay, put this oil plant here and do this and mine this lithium. Like, you have no idea what the prices of those things are. You don't yeah. know anything. Like, even one person, one person to know like anything about lithium and make a prediction about that, that's hard enough and they're gonna right. be wrong. So it's just so it, but what I'm getting at here is just these ideas are so rapidly irrational and so contrary to what free people choose on the market. And yet by vote, we're talking, of people are okay with them being imposed, like this clean energy standard. Right. Like we, people are generally okay with, yeah, oh, the government should totally dictate what kind of electricity we use. And that's become normalized and we're reassured, yeah, it can probably work. And all these smart people wouldn't be saying it, it, it will work if it won't work. And then you yeah. start to see like, wait, isn't California starting to have problems? Isn't Texas starting to have problems? Right. Um, but I think people can get if you just it, it's important to explain in today's context, like, hey, these these solar and wind, these are not competitive alternatives. These are unreliables that are being foisted on us. And ultimately, I think it's very powerful to go back to a philosophical point. They're being foisted on us by people who don't really care about energy. And mm -hmm. the evidence is most of the green energy movement is anti-fossil fuel. It's anti-nuclear. It's anti-hydro. 
And it's even not building solar and wind because they have too much impact. So the solar and wind mining gets opposed, transmission lines get opposed, building them on actual ground gets opposed for too much impact. So the whole movement behind them is not, it's not a movement that's enthusiastic about energy. Mm-hmm. It's a movement that's enthusiastic about stopping energy because it has yeah. impact on nature. And I think if you get that, then it makes sense that the enthusiasm for green energy is a total farce at least by the leadership. It's not that they have this thing that's so great because if it's so great, it could compete. It's they like the idea of it. They want to promote the idea of it so that they have the, the ability to shut down the energy that works. Right. But there's no reality of, oh yeah, we're going to ban everything that works. And then this thing that totally fails is going to magically work tomorrow. But that that is what people have been taught to believe, which is why I'm kind of very emphatic about just explaining this world in a lot of detail so people can mm. get, oh yeah, this is a farce, even though everyone's telling me it's this, it's the opportunity of a lifetime to go green. Yeah, I, I see this and I argue this very pragmatically that the market is always more intelligent than this totalitarian arrogance we're describing, where it's like this guy figured out the solution for the next 20 years, just need to implement mm-hmm. it, right? Just need to print $16 trillion and implement this against the will of the market. Um, the so market the- is like the market is individual. So I would just say, like, I mean, one way of thinking of it is millions of free individuals mm-hmm. uh, are much are morally entitled and sort of actually able to figure out the best ways to create wealth. And yes. then, you know, a dictator is morally unentitled right. and completely incapable of doing it. But I just, when market, so market often, it's one of these collective things. And I think it often works against advocates of freedom to talk too much about it because it has this idea of, oh, it's this kind of mystical force that optimizes for the common good mm-hmm. versus like free, like I talk more about free individuals. Uh, and, you know, market, you could, I mean, a real market is not like this this collective, I mean, it's just, it's just a place where people get together. Right. So it's really trying to describe the interactions of free individuals. So I just wanted to put in that. I think of it more that. Yeah. I agreed with you on that. So we get more specific and say where I agree with you, it's morally superior to have a distributed group of freely acting individual individuals Mm -hmm. determining the ultimate course of action. But I also say that that distributed group of freely acting individuals is more intelligent than any group of government yes. bureaucrats can possibly be from a very pragmatic standpoint. And that is the bandwidth of human active awareness can only take in so, and process so much data at a time that the market itself or this distributed group of freely acting individuals, what I, what I would call a decentralized computing network of humans is always mm-hmm. going to outcompete a centralized computing network of bureaucrats. So it's not just like it's not even up for debate. And the one I look at it that way, it's you cannot, as far as if, if we're looking at it from a perspective and you may correct me here of satisfying the most aims for the most people, which I guess would be a utilitarian standpoint, right. the market's always going to satisfy that for the most people more so than any government ever can. Like where, is that how you yeah, see it? As well? I mean, I, I wouldn't say that as the goal yet. Yeah, it's tricky. And, and um, I'm going to think after this interview about just, maybe better ways of, of explaining this. Cause I don't, I don't spend, um, I love these issues, but I don't spend most of my time explaining them. So, yeah. but I think that it's, it's, so if you get like the fact that it's like the morally right thing and that it's practical for the individual aren't unrelated because part of the reason why it's morally right is this is how human beings right. actually survive. So you can think yes. of like, there's the bandwidth issue. So that that's true. I mean, in terms yeah. of just like more, if you think of like, being productive, like, you know, ultimately we want to create value. Like you want as many minds specializing for mutual benefit uh, as possible. Yes. Right. And yes. so if you're thinking about like, I mean, here, maybe here's a way to think about it. Uh, like if I think about, okay, how do I want my food to be determined? Is it like, do I want the person Joe Biden appoints to command as many people as he wants to produce food? Or do I want all of these other people to be free to collaborate and or yes. to compete to produce food? It's like, I want those other people to, A, because they can engage in these collaborations. Yes. And then at least there's maybe a C, but B, because they can compete against one another and I'm not required. And to you can choose, choose freely. Yeah. Those two dynamics of you get 
collect, you get levels of collaboration that are yeah. impossible from a single person. And then you get levels of discovery through yes. competition yes, yes, yes. that are impossible. So those are kind of two, and, and again, I'm thinking a little bit uh, on my feet here. The right. other dimension though, is that the value is, indiv- we could put it as individual, right? So and this is like, nobody can know what is best for me. Right. Nobody can know what is best for you. So there's, there's right. an element in which they're fundamentally incapable of knowing like what, like, what does it mean for them to decide, you know, do I want somebody deciding how I should live my life? Yes. Like you could say they have no right to do, which is definitely true, but like they cannot know, know. they can know maybe relevant information to right. them. They can advise me, but that's, you know, free society, anyone, you can take advice from anyone, but the idea of, oh, Joe Biden's going to appoint somebody and they're going to tell me how to have a happy life. Like you would regard that as absurd. Doesn't mean I'm guaranteed yes. to have one myself. Right. But so that, I think the individual element always has to be brought in and it's rarely brought in in economic stuff. It's usually yeah. this view of, Ayn Rand would call this intrinsicism, just the view that certain things are intrinsically valuable. Like, oh, education is intrinsically valuable or even like working in the tech industry is in, intrinsically yeah. valuable or like, I, this yeah. diversity is intrinsic. It's like, that's not true. Anytime I hear I mean, that term, intrinsic value, it's like an immediate non-starter for me because it just <laughs> it doesn't exist. There is no such thing as intrinsic value. Right, and, and I guess particularly from an Austrian perspective, you would you'd yeah. be really sensitive uh, to that kind of thing. So, I mean, I do think there's such a thing as like object. Well, yeah, I think there are objective types of value to human being. Like, I think thinking in general is an objective value. I think production is an objective. As in this, this by its nature furthers human life. Right. Uh, by its nature, but there's certainly nothing like specific that you can dictate, like the specific values for an individual yes. need can only be identified by the individual. And so that that's why the whole government controlled it. Like even it's called an economy, but what does that mean? It's just, that's just people's lives right. and how they produce and trade. Like it's a non-starter. Nobody can, te- nobody can figure out and, and has the right to like what is actually good for you. So that's yet another, so like in a free society, it's like, I get to decide what's good for me. And then part of that is I want to trade. I want to trade with, uh, you know, I want to trade. Ultimately, I want to trade with these sort of large collections of people solving problems in harmony Mm -hmm. who are competing with these other large collections of people, because that is how they're going to discover the the truth. So that's at least a bunch of the elements of why it's so superior to be free Yes. Versus not to be free. Listen, Rothbard has this quote, I think it's very apt for this. He said, to be moral and act must be free. So it's it's connecting this pragmatism and moral domain uh quite a bit. So let's see, to be moral and yeah, that is that I don't is think you true. can compel a moral act, and I don't think a compelled well, act can be moral. I, I think that's a little bit slippery. So mm. Because you can say, like, let's say, let's say the view is, um, you know, let's just say it's like you're. I'm trying to think of a view that most people will find wrong, which is hard to think of. I'm trying to think of like a religious view that most people would think of as okay. This is, this is really um, irrational. So, I don't know. Let's let's say you think like okay, everyone should. Say, I was going to say Zeus, but I, I like Zeus is actually, <laughs> I, I, I kind of have an affinity for the Greek God. So let, let's just say like a very, let's just say like a very militant form of religion that I think most people would say, okay, that's right. Yeah. Where it's just like, okay, you, you know, you need to sacrifice and like, you should be willing to engage in like suicide bombing and crusades and this kind of thing. Like, right. Like if, if I, I don't think so, he's saying just before we go that every free act is moral. It's no, just, no, no. I know he's not saying yeah, no. I, okay. Right. Yeah. No, I, I think I get that. Yeah. But it's it's like if that if you're actually so let's just say you are obligated to here is an easier example Nazism like you're obligated to kill Jews. You know, the the moral is basically the triumph of an Aryan race. So they're defining that as mm. this is what is good. This is what human beings should aim toward. If you say like, oh, well, it's only really moral if the Jews choose to put themselves in the gas chamber. Like Mm. you can sort of say that, but you're also assuming like a narrower, 
and I think a more correct version of morality, but like Mm -hmm. part of the, so morality basically just means what is the right thing to do? What Mm -hmm. should we choose? What is the right thing to choose? Now, within that, I agree with Rothbard that the proper morality should involve being chosen by the individual, but it's not true that all interpretations of morality okay, value yes. the individual's Fair choice. Enough. And in Fair fact, enough. most don't. Yes. I think implied so, so, here, and maybe this quote was pulled out of context where he said this. No, but, I don't think it, I don't think it was. I think it's actually one of these things where there's an, a, this is a place where I'd be critical of him, where there's an yeah. attempt to escape the need to really go into morality. And it's the idea that yeah. like, whatever your morality is, it supports freedom. And I don't believe that. I think actually most moralities oppose freedom. And I think when people say like, oh, to be moral, it has to be chosen. They're actually, they're only selecting certain, they're, they're again, an Iran term, frozen abstraction. They're, they're, they're using a type of morality mm-hmm. to, for all of morality. And a type of morality says, yes, it needs to be chosen, but not all of morality says right. that to be morality needs to be chosen. Okay. We'll have to table that one. That one sounds like a, quite the rabbit hole. Um, <laughs> very interesting point. So, so let me ask you this then from a government standpoint, the other, well, the other thing I was, first of all, before that, uh, the marketplace, it's the other piece to that, that seems very pragmatically useful is that entrepreneurs have very tight feedback loops, right? So they're experimenting mm. with something, they're getting information of what works and what That's doesn't, they're huge. adapting. Whereas the bureaucratic model is a much more elongated, distorted feedback loop that doesn't even the idea of like the modeling. I just came up with the Saifedean in our last podcast and he was on my podcast. We were, Mm -hmm. he made this good point about like just how modeling, like as it exists now is largely a product of government. Like right, you think about, exactly. You think about like, would Amazon hire somebody to say, oh, let's model the economy for the next 20 years? And they probably would not. Yeah. Because they, you know, Steve Jobs, I don't know if he famously said this, but he often talk about like, my headlights don't go that far, like more than three or four yes. years in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's yeah. a visionary, right? Yeah. Who could be more of a visionary. So, yeah. yeah, I think a lot. And certainly, like, with all these systems that people have no actual ability, no actual marketable ability to do. Yes. There's an infinite market in government because it justifies coercion, right. which is what people want the models exactly. yeah. for. So yeah, I, th- I think that that is, that's a real uh, issue of, yeah. the So if you contrast that with freedom, yeah. And freedom, like you would love to be able to make these forecasts, but you recognize the complex, the complexity of what is sort of in everyone's interest, determined interests at a given time. Like there's so many unknowns to that and you're yes. so far from omniscient yes. that like you just recognize, yeah, I can't, like I can try to predict things, but I really have to be dynamic. Whereas right. look at everyone is saying basically, yeah, like let's go solar and wind and this many batteries by 2050. And they're like, yeah, that's going to work really well. Mm-hmm. And the idea that there's one thing of, is that going to totally destroy the country? Which I would say probably yes, but certainly you can't argue that that can be optimal. Mm -hmm. It can't just be you make up something 30 years in the future and that's optimal. Like the only optimal thing is actually being discovered by millions of people. Continuously. Being free to think. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. I I think it's an excellent point. Um, I guess the nature of markets, both from a cooperative and competitive standpoint, is that it's constantly pushing people to excel, to excel Mm -hmm. towards the satisfaction of consumer wants. So, you know, Mises would say the consumer is sovereign in the marketplace. Uh, again, I'm using the term market to mean the distributed group of right, freedom. and even that's an interesting. You might like. Um, I hope I motivate you and some others to read Ayn Rand, but you might really you, like. You she have. has an essay called "What Is Capitalism?" Okay. And there's actually, I think, I don't know if it's over, but the Ayn Rand Institute. My uh, my favorite person there is a big mentor of mine. This really smart philosopher named Ankar Gatte. I know he was holding a seminar on this essay, which I got to check out. I don't know if it's still live or not, but in any case. And the S, it's a funny essay because it's called "What Is Capitalism," and that just seems like pretty boring. Yeah. But it's unbelievable. I think it's the it's like, and it challenges a lot. It's coming from a very pro free market person, but it's really saying these are the philosophical foundations of economics, and it's it's challenging not only status economics, but many of the foundations or lack of foundations of um, of uh, free market economics. And, yeah. and the basic idea of it is that there's a huge tribal element that much of free market, much less so Austrians, by the way, but yeah. that much of quote free market economics is adopted where they think they don't recognize either the nature of the individual, like the productive nature of the individual, some of the dynamics we're talking about here, or the moral value of the individual. Right. And thus that ultimately 
sort of leads the profession of economics to promote statism, not capitalism, yeah. which I think inarguably is what it does today. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. You know, I, I'm very uh, inspired to check out Ayn Rand. Others have mentioned her, but, um, you know, this talk today Good. is definitely helping. Um, let me ask you this. And so government with a monopolization over money, inflation revenue, very easy to generate. You know, there's no checks, essentially. Um, mm -hmm. All they need maybe occasionally is a good crisis for an excuse to fire up you know, the money printers, which is actually just a database manipulation. Mm -hmm. um, so they are, and to your point, it's not only the direct cost of the inflation that's being implicitly taxed out of the productive economy, but it's also these follow-on consequences. Like what are they using those proceeds to do? Like a green new deal, which is going to have other and disastrous effects. And what's not being done before? What's not yeah, done. what's being withdrawn from the productive economy? What's not being done? That's back it's to kind the of like the analogy might be. So I think it's a great point, and the analogy would be what I was talking about in the realm of ideas. Mm -hmm. if you think about how destructive education yes. has has been, and like I mean, I haven't given all my views on energy, but I like with even with this this idea of delicate nurture, like how much that is spread, and that's just one of a million bad right. ideas, particularly bad one. But yeah. So you just think like it's so How many other in a ones? sense it's so <laughs> little about the resources that were taken. Yes. Right? It's much more the the sort of coercion that is employed with the diverted resources. The, and how yes. that screws everything else up. And this up. is getting to the crux of my question, I think, because it's there this kind of gets into the, I think it was Henry Hazlitt, maybe Bastiat before him talked about the seen and the unseen, where it's like, you mm -hmm. see the certain things that these productive factors are being allocated towards, but what you don't right. see is all the things that weren't the, the wants that went unsatisfied, let's say. Right. So we're doing that at an accelerating rate in money, right? We're, you know, expanding the money supply even more to paper over these losses. And that is funding larger Green New Deals or clean new, what are the, whatever these um, flawed mm -hmm. pieces of legislation are, is that why we now have this World Economic Forum propaganda that is essentially a total war on property? You know, I don't know if you've seen this advertisement. It says in ten years you'll own nothing and be happy. Because um, when I see that, that's you know, if we if we take property rights as the basis for all civilization, and now we have. Well, World Economic Forum propaganda telling us no more property. Well, it's a, that's again a package deal, right? Because there's an issue like renting is owning. Like renting right. is a form of, I mean, renting, you could have all renting and it's 100% consistent with property rights. Of but, course. But you could also have the government controlling everything and then you own nothing yeah. in a socialist or a fat, you know, the fascist fashion is actually the more fashionable one. Right. Uh, right, right now in terms of like pseudo owner. So fascism just means, uh, ownership in name only, but it right. basically means, you know, you have the responsibility of ownership, but not the right to control what you own. So <laughs> right. it's just, it's so unjust. And, you yeah. know, at the World Economic Forum, they're deliberately mixing that together. So for example, I don't drive. I don't own a car. I pay for Uber. You know, I pay for somebody to drive me like, well, you know, some something like that. Sure. Well, that's like, I don't feel like, oh, I need to own a car because I don't even want to drive the thing. No, yeah, of course. But, 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 but that's like you but could if you wanted so that, to. Yeah, right. And yes. and I do own. I mean, I do own my money. Yes. Right. And I am in effect helping. Well, as much as you of, can. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, I own it as much, and I want to own it more than I, yeah. than I have the right to right now. And that's so, what but, Bitcoin but is. But that's yeah. like. <laughs> but they're mixing that. To, they're mixing that kind of progress together with like yeah. In a sense, it's not as cost effective to maybe it's not co as cost effective to sort of own and keep at home as yes. many things. Uh, like it would be better to sort of buy them fractionally through renting. Like that's great, but they're mixing that together with, yeah, the government should control your life. And yeah, we right. get to, we get to turn your thermostat up uh, when it's, when you yes. want to turn it down. Like right now, California would not like where my thermostat is at, right? I'm yeah. in California. It's getting to be the afternoon. We created a policy that enter, that electricity doesn't work very well when the sun goes down, Yeah, much to my opposition. And so between five and 10, you're being told, like, oh, don't use much electricity. Well, like, so they want the ability to, so their view of not owning things is like, yeah, we own- Do what you're told. Own, yeah, we own your thermostat. And it's, yeah. you know, there's all these euphemisms. It's a smart grid, like a smart meter. And it's just, yeah, we control your life. Yeah, so the World Economic Forum, I think is, I can't say it's all bad, but I'm quite confident that it's mostly bad. 
And yeah. certainly this idea of a great reset is, is really a great regress because yeah. it's really just, you know, regress to government control over everything. And like they talk about build back better. And yeah. that's really just the government control, like well, better than what? It's really better than freedom. Right, right, better right. Better than capitalism. Yes. It's like, oh, now that a bunch of stuff got destroyed and we're sort of used to it, now give us control and we're going to build all these things. But it's like all the good stuff definitely would not, like imagine they built modern agriculture. I mean, in some ways you could say they've distorted it, but like they did, like so much of what is built in the world, you would not want the, the World Economic Forum, I mean, none of it they could have achieved. Like imagine the World Economic Forum is like 40 years ago, oh, let's, there's a, some setback in the computer industry. And they're like, oh, Klaus Schwab, he's going to lead, he's going to be the dictator of computers. Mm -hmm. Does anyone think we would have better computation now right. if Klaus Schwab had done build back better? No, it was like, it was built freely. And yes. that's what we should morally and economically aspire to. Yeah, agree completely. I know. We, so we've been talking about a lot of philosophy stuff that I love to talk about. And I think, I mean, everything's interrelated, but I think, you know, in particular, as we jump into energy, you know, what I talked about in terms of our basic framework, so like delicate nurture premise versus wild potential and eliminating human impact versus advancing human flourishing. And then the idea of, you know, a society of free and an economy of free individuals versus a government dictated uh, economy. I think all of those are very important uh, as we look at energy. Mm. Now that I would just talk, and, and, and the other thing I mentioned was the, the concept of, of cost-effective energy, that we want energy that's low cost, on demand, versatile, and on a global scale of billions of people in, in thousands of places. I think if you have that, if you have that context, it should be striking that fossil fuels are so dominant, especially if you look at the history, because mm. many of these alternatives have been around for 100 plus years. And yet fossil fuels are 80% the world's energy. So that's four times all alternatives combined. And if you look at, you know, there's this idea of they're subsidized, but just on a common sense level, you can see governments are mostly opposing fossil fuels. They're not very pro fossil mm -hmm. fuels. And that bears out in practice, like solar and wind, what I call the unreliables, they are dozens of times more subsidized. I think even more than that, because you can't equate reliable energy and unreliable energy. Uh, so the main thing is actually the grid pays the same for reliable energy and unreliable energy. It's the total like government scam that would never exist in a free market. So what it should be striking that, yeah, why has the market, why has you know the world chosen to use this? And I think it's important to understand that on the level of energy technology, as well as just the fact that it's a market phenomenon, particularly because we have all these anti-market attacks and, and all these anti-market claims that are saying, oh, well, solar and wind if just imposed, are going to be great. And maybe even free market people are sympathetic because they're like, oh, well, we don't have market anyway and solar and wind sound good. I don't know if they're sympathetic, mm. but a lot of people seem sympathetic. So I think it's useful to talk about what are the attributes? Why are, why are fossil fuels so successful? And then once we understand that, I think it's very easy to understand why solar and wind are very unsuccessful and why their prospects are not very good. Mm. So the, uh, I would put it in two categories. One is fossil fuels have a remarkable combination of natural attributes. That's one. And two is that they have a continuing history of generations of economic innovation and achievement. So they have certain attributes. And then there are generations of millions of smart people figuring out how to harness those attributes uh, in cost-effective ways. And a lot of those ways are not transferable or not at least fully transferable to other things. Mm. So that's the high level. The, the specific attributes are fossil fuels are naturally stored, they're naturally concentrated, and they're naturally abundant. So naturally stored means that like a fossil fuel, technically called a hydrocarbon, it's a store of energy. It's ultimately ancient life that was sort of preserved and compressed through a series of processes historically. But the main thing is it's like hydrogen and carbon atoms that store a lot of energy chemically, and then you can release it by burning it. And there's a lot of energy in a small amount of space, or in the case of natural gas, which takes up a bunch of spaces still with a very small mass. So mm. it's naturally stored. And it's important, like whereas solar and wind are intermittent flows of energy. Mm. So they're not naturally stored. They flow and they don't flow continuously. Now, like if you're right. in outer space and you can get directly to the sun, it's still, it's, it has the issue of it's not very concentrated. It's, it's fairly concentrated out there though. 
but it's it's continuous. But on right. Earth, it's not continuous. But you need energy not only continuously, you need it on demand. You need to be able to vary it on yes. demand. So you need it right. constantly. You need it to be able to adjust it. And so a stored source of energy is an enormous advantage there because if you don't store it, then basically you need to figure out if you don't have natural storage, you need to make man-made storage. And right. man-made storage turns out to be a total bitch, which yeah. is why I hope that didn't affect your podcast rating. For no, sure. no, no, no. Whatever that is. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, so if you look at like the three leading sources of energy, the only ones that succeed without massive subsidies, they are fossil fuels, nuclear and hydro, and all three of those are naturally stored. So nuclear yeah. has a, an amazing amount of energy naturally stored in the nucleus of an atom. Yeah. Uh, and hydro is stored like the evaporation of water, you know, brings brings water vapor water to the top of a river yeah. and nature and it's and you can store it in a dam, but it's like nature did that for us. Yeah. And so we didn't have to do it. Imagine you had to carry the water up to the top of the river. Right. It could never be cost effective, right? Yeah, if you yeah. had to store it yourself. And so that's it's notable that the economic sources of energy all have natural storage. It's not it's not a, like a law that you could never have it, but it's you just have to recognize if you don't have natural storage, you really have to figure out some form of man-made right, right, storage. Right. Yeah. That's very expensive because nature yeah. uses another perspective. Is nature uses a huge amount of energy to store things for us, but we don't have to pay for that energy. Mm -hmm. We don't have to pay for the sunlight to evaporate the water to get at the top of the river. We don't right. have to pay for the old plants that became fossil fuels or the old plankton that became fossil fuels. Yes, yes, yes. But if we did, and we had to manufacture it ourselves, we could never afford it. it just take yes, too much time. Right, right. Um, so it's naturally stored and related to that, it's naturally concentrated. So it's a large amount of energy in either, in sort of and or a small amount of space or a small amount of mass. So with oil, it's both. Coal, it's both, but to a little less extent. Gas, it's small amount of mass. Do you That's call that energy important. density by chance? Yes. Okay. Yes. So I should have said concentration is more, I think, accessible, but yeah, it's energy density. Yeah. yeah. And again, it's it's you can think of it as density by volume, density by mass, or both. Um, mm. Density by volume is particularly great because of, well, both are great, but uh, mm. for transportation. Yeah. Of particularly anything that's portable, like the machine itself. And then even with something like coal, it's a big advantage that it's dense. Yes. It's one reason why you can use coal everywhere or with nuclear, why you can use it anywhere theoretically because yeah. it's, it's very cheap to ship if it's physically small and, right. and rather physically light. And then the other thing is it's naturally abundant. So if it was naturally stored, naturally concentrated, but there wasn't very much of it, then it wouldn't be very useful. Mm. Uh, but fortunately, there's a ton of it, and it's because it comes from this ancient life, and there's just, you're talking about hundreds of millions of years. Now, not all the life got preserved by any means, but it's, you know, you know, very conservative estimate is with all the fossil fuels, there's more in the ground than, ten, 10 times more in the ground than we've used in the whole history of civilization. Wow. So okay. There's a lot yeah. of stuff. And then there's, yeah. that doesn't mean it's all easily accessible. There's a question yeah. of how cost effectively can you do it, but that technology is always improving. And so in general, when there's freedom, those prices tend to go down and certainly the volume tends to go up. And then mm -hmm. we have nuclear, which has much more long-term potential. So there's no, if you're, and so it's notable, nuclear is the only other thing that has natural, natural uh, storage, natural concentration and, uh, and natural abundance, arguably some forms of geothermal that are hypothetical. You could sort of put in that category, but it's mainly fossil fuels and nuclear, whereas so solar and wind are intermittent and dilute flows. So they are abundant. There was plenty of them mm -hmm. if, if you could purpose them. But again, instead of naturally stored, they're naturally inter, uh, intermittent flows. And instead of naturally concentrated, they're naturally dilute. Yeah. And so then you have the challenge if you're trying to replicate with the naturally stored, in, you're trying to replicate a naturally stored and concentrated fuel with a naturally intermittent and dilute fuel. So the yes. strike fuel is, okay, that's, you're starting on the wrong foot. Like you would expect in the general historical trend has been that the more like stored and more uh, concentrated or dense source of energy wind. So, you know, over yes. time we've gone from like, you know, we've gone from like the sun and the wind to wood, to coal, to oil, to yes. uh, gas. And so it would seem odd that, okay, we're going to go, we're going to go back to, Let's let's collect dilute intermittent energy and let's figure out a way to store it and concentrate it using 
And how are you going to do that? And right yeah, now, yeah. It's almost all occurs using fossil fuels. Can you describe, um, just for the audience, the concept of intermittency and dilute diluteness as it relates yeah. to solar and wind? Sure. So, I mean, intermittency is just, let's see, I'm looking outside. The sun is not shining very, I don't know what time it is, like six o'clock here, Pacific mm -hmm. time, but like it's not shining very brightly. So the inter intermittent just means, you know, you can think of it as, I think most people know the word, but it's yeah. you know, discontinuous. Yeah. And so- Sometimes it's sometimes, cloudy, sometimes it's not. Yeah. And and yeah. it's important that it's, it's, it's not even, it's not binary either. Yeah. If it were binary, it'd be a problem. Yeah. But it's, it's both binary and- Variable. So at the night, in the night, there's no solar energy, mm -hmm. and and you know, at times there's virtually no wind, but then there are times when there's just a lot less of it. You know, it tends to be like later in the afternoon, there's mm -hmm. less of it, and then there's clouds, and so it's really, it's really a rough starting point to mm -hmm. start with something because in general, with electricity in particular, which is what solar and wind are used for, like the whole idea of it is it adjusts perfectly to your need for it. That's right. the grid does. Yes. It adjusts, it adjusts supply with incredible speed and precision to demand, but right. that's because using stored energy. Yeah. So it can just say, Oh, I'm going to use more or less of my store. You're drawing right on now. a stock instead of relying on a flow. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's not even, it's intermittent. Yeah. Flow. And then, mostly uh, largely unpredictable. Yeah. So the yeah. wind is the same thing. You know, the wind is blowing sometimes blowing at different intensity and then diluteness is, yeah. So the, um, you just think of it as I think of energy as machine calories. So you just think of how many calories are coming in like in sunlight. So there's a kind of truism that's more or less true in energy that solar is one kilowatt per meter squared, which is actually not too bad, but it's still okay. quite dilute compared to other things. And then like the solar panel will tend to convert it at 20%. Um, but that's only when the sun is shining in really good conditions. So if you mm. just compare that with like what a nuclear power plant can do and what a gas plant can do in the same area, it's, you need a much, much bigger area. And actually if people, um, right. I, I tweet a lot about this stuff. If you, my Twitter is just my name, Alex Epstein. If you search my name and Elon Musk, you'll probably find a bunch of things. But one thing is I, I called him out on the, he had this, this claim, which I, I get, I really like him in a lot of ways, but I find it so annoying that he, I mean, worse than annoying that he'll just say these things that are just so dishonest. So he said, oh yeah, you can power the whole world with solar and some batteries. So I ran the numbers on the batteries and I, I calculated what his prices would take $400 trillion, which again, that's a meaningless number, yeah. but it's, you know, that's four and a half times GDP. Yeah. Uh, to have just yeah. the batteries for this. But yeah. he also just said, oh yeah, solar is actually as good as a nuclear plant. And if you look at it, it's just, it's total BS. Um, right. He, what he was doing is he was taking solar panels uh, and, and acting like they were, the sun was always shining in the ideal location and there was no spacing among them. Right. And actually, so he's overestimating it, I believe by a factor of 30 in terms uh. of what the real world is. So yeah. And you just think like, yeah, the sun and the wind, they are dilute, but the main, the, the worst thing by far is the intermittency because uh -huh. the intermittency thing means that you need to build a whole additional system to either fully or partially substitute for the solar and wind when they're not working. And so theoretically, there are only three ways to do that. So one, the way that it's actually done is to use reliable power plants, usually powered by fossil fuels. So yeah. in that case, it's to be a parasite. And as you might imagine, that increases costs a lot. Yeah, But it doesn't increase costs as much as the others, which aren't done at all. And so one is what I call relying on far away unreliables. I call solar and wind unreliables, not renewables, because mm -hmm. renewables deliberately excludes hydro because they think hydro has too much impact. It's, it's a really religious mm -hmm. term. So yeah. unreliables is a better. And of course, they'd be opposed to solar and wind if they were practical. That's the dirty secret. The environmental movement only supports imaginary energy. Why is that? What? what? <laughs> because their goal is to eliminate human impact. Energy is impact. I mean, energy... Energy is inherently an impacting phenomenon. The process of producing it always has a lot of impact. Is this a conscious aim the or is this just back to that original <laughs> ignorance propagating itself forwards? Well, it's not, it's more to the, it's, it's, I would, you know, you called it camouflage or we're talking about camouflage yeah. or disguise. Yeah. So there's a real question of like, what is, you know, whenever we're talking about action and policy, there's a question of what is our goal? You can, mm -hmm. or what is it like? Mm -hmm. What is the primary What's goal the that we're yep. pursuing? 
And I think often, particularly in, on a societal level, people have no idea what their goal is, but there can still be a goal that's driving them. And so mm -hmm. I submit that the goal driving energy is absolutely eliminating our impact on earth. You look mm -hmm. at like, what is the number one policy right now in the world? The number one moral policy in the world right now is eliminating our impact on climate. You know, they call it carbon neutral, yeah. right? Net zero. But that is literally the number one. If you look at corporations, if you look at governments, they've said our number one priority. And notice it's not even let's have a really livable climate because that would require a lot of impact. It's just right. let's not impact climate. And it has this delicate nurture element of, yeah, everything's going to hell and the science proves it. But again, like if you look at this, we can really master climate very well. And as I point out in moral case, and it's still true, like we're 50 times safer from climate-related death than we used to be. Climate-related death has plummeted over the past right, 100 right, years right, yeah. because our mastery increases. Like we change climate some. I don't think it's even provably negative, but even if it was, our mastery ability is so much greater. So it's essentially like we've vaccinated ourselves against climate yeah, uh, for the most part. And, and even it would be a lot better were it not for all these green anti-mastery policies, like letting the forest go out of control and not, not actually mastering them. Yeah. So there's no actual, re I mean, there's there again, but people buy into it because of the disguises. So the actual goal that's driving us is eliminating our impact on the earth. Like that's yeah. why again, anti-fossil fuel, anti-nuclear, anti-hydro, even anti-solar wind. Again, you can't, anti the mining, anti transmission lines, anti actually building the thing. Like, so we, we have an anti energy culture that's driven by this goal, but most people have no idea that that's what's driving right. them. And, it, and in part, it's disguised by people think, oh, no, we're making the world cleaner somehow. Like, we're making it safer. Yes. It's this idea of the environment, it's packaging yes. together an unimpacted environment with a good livable environment. Right. So that's one thing. And then this delicate nurture thing is a huge disguise. Like you see it totally with climate where it's like, yeah, no, we're, pers we're really pursuing this goal because we want to save everyone from the apocalypse. Mm -hmm. And you think, okay, but wait, you're against nuclear, you're against hydro, and you're not mm -hmm. even building solar and wind as quickly as you say you need, which, so it's, it's camouflaged, but nevertheless, it's the goal. And this yeah. is a really, this is another thing I think, I mean, I've thought about it more just sort of independently, but I think it's something I have in common with Ayn Rand where she she talks a lot about certain goals animating the society. And one thing she's really big on is that self-sacrifice is animating the society. And I think a criticism she gets a lot is like, I don't believe that. Like, I don't really believe in the sacrifice of the productive, the unproductive. Like, I just want to be nice to people. And I just want to give 1% charity or something like that. But like our society is absolutely sacrificing the productive to the unproductive. Yeah. And but for sure it is sacrificing energy to the god of an unimpacted planet. There's no doubt about that. So it's a really interesting question of how that works, but there's no question that it like so, once you point it out, like you can't really unsee it. Yeah. So let me ask you this. I'm just thinking out loud here as well. It seems like there is this um this use or appeal to kind of universal concepts in a way to camouflage some of these aims like this, the one I'm, I'm getting here is cleanliness, right? It sounds good to have, mm. uh, to clean up the world, the clean energy act, whatever you may call it. And, you know, we know that that is not something, I mean, from my mind, my capitalist standpoint is that you can only have cleanliness of the environment. Again, if you have, the preservation of property rights, right? If someone mm -hmm. has some recourse to you polluting their land or river that they can, um, mm -hmm. through the legal mechanism, they can basically push that cost back into the polluter, which would mm -hmm. then disincentivize pollution, right? It would, it would incentivize clean production mm -hmm. processes. It, it, have we, is it, are, I guess what I'm trying to get, are we self-deceiving that you know, the are the environmentalists self-deceptive? Like, do they actually have good intentions, but they've deceived themselves into believing that solar and wind is the answer without actually doing the critical analysis necessary? Or is there some malintention beneath this? Like, is there actual anti-human intent beneath this? Uh, how how, do, how do we get here? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I, I like to stress. Some of these things get to be psychological. So I, mm. what I really like to establish is what's actually causally operating in terms of like what ideas are we, what ideas are we actually pursuing? 
And so mm-hmm. that's like my number one focus is to convince people like we're actually pursuing this because it's, it's, everyone wants to deny it. They really want to act like, no, we're really, we really care about human flourishing. Like we agree with you. We just want to protect the climate. I'm just like, mm-hmm. no, you don't. But right. you want to protect the climate from human beings. Yeah. You want to sacrifice human beings to the idea of an impact of climate. Yeah. Uh, so, and again, I've talked about how the average, I like think the average person is largely roped into this through these disguises, but there's also a major element of self-sacrifice as a virtue that I think has to be part of it. And I don't agree that it's a virtue. It's a very controversial idea, but mm-hmm. I think human beings are creators. I don't think we need to sacrifice to each other. I don't think it's proper uh, mm-hmm. for us to sacrifice to each other. Again, like the fact that, uh, just, you know, th- one other interesting Ayn Rand point is that she said, you know, I could never have come up with my philosophy before the industrial revolution. It's a really interesting thing to say. Mm. And why did she say that? And it's because the industrial revolution really proved that human beings are creators who survive by reason. Before we figured out how to use machines to produce so much value for us, we did survive by reason, but it wasn't as obvious because we couldn't do it very well. But once you can see, oh, human beings can assemble resources into these machines, of course, powered by energy, that can do all this work, then you really see oh, it's the thinker, like it's the thought that does it. Yeah. And we have this unlimited ability to rearrange the elements of nature, you know, raw matter and energy and make it valuable. And right. then you really get, wow, humans are productive. And, and her view is that should really that should really change our view of morality. Like we right. should re in light, because a lot of the views of morality came about when people thought that the earth was just scarce resources and that human beings were inherently opposed to, you know, our interests were inherently opposed. Right. And capitalism shows that our our interests are very much uh, harmonized. Right. And certainly that we can all live and flourish without sacrifice. And so once we know that about human nature, what is the justice or or sense of saying like you should give up your life? Like yeah. why can't everything be like what we're doing now? So so let, let, so that's so that. interesting. If we can drill into that, then so there was this. Uh, realization, I guess, that the world is not zero sum in a way. Post industrial yeah, revolution, one way of putting it. right? We've yeah. we realized the the positive sum nature of the division of labor, specialization of knowledge, all these things. Um, right. I want to I want to drill it. That's really fascinating. And then I want to drill into this topic of sacrifice you just mentioned, though. So, agreed that we don't need to sacrifice ourselves towards something, but I think the basis of economics tells us that we do have to sacrifice something towards say that's what savings is, right? <laughs> no, you know, like, see, that's another, it's another like I keep using the term package deal, but it's another one, right? Because it's sacrifice in the it, it packages together an investment and a loss. Okay. So sacrifice is really a loss. Like that's well, I, that's, I'm thinking of foregone consumption for the purposes of saving. So not there's not right. actually a loss entailed with that. It would just right, be, but I think of that as that it's an invest. It's a it's an investment in your future. That's yes, what I think exactly. Of. Like I would classify that as an investment. Right. So you are you are um or you could also call it saving. But in any case, it has nothing. So like, you know, just to take in a, like a career example, uh, like me deciding to become a practical philosopher who specializes in energy and has all these controversial views, like that's a, that's a non-sacrificial thing. Like I did that because I wanted to do it. You could right. imagine that, and this wasn't the case, but you could imagine like my mom wanted me to become a rabbi, which wasn't true. So I don't want to invite <laughs> my mom at all, but like that could be, like that would have been a sacrifice. I don't mm-hmm. want to do that right now. One might imagine that my career trajectory is not the easiest career trajectory to have, particularly if you're sure. not independently wealthy, which I wasn't. Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of adversity and there's, a, so people could look at what I have dealt with, which I, by no means I'm trying to get, garner any sympathy. I live in yeah. America in a free country, so yeah. I don't yeah. deserve any sympathy, but just you could look at some of that stuff and think, oh yeah, oh, you made all these sacrifices. But I think of it no, as I made these investments and it's very, it's mm. fundamentally different in character from I took a loss because I thought my life belonged to somebody else. Gotcha. And so I don't okay. like combining okay, okay. those. So that's that's one of the worst package deals. I mean, I think sacrifice is a good term, but I, I don't think it should be packaged 
with investment. Right. Like okay. 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 So that, that's interesting. Yeah. This is a uh, sort of a subtle semantic thing, perhaps. Well, they're, would... they're, they're, so, they're not that, I mean, they're so consequential, right? It affects, like, I would say 90% of the population is harmed by having an unclear concept of sacrifice. Gotcha. Okay. So the way I was conceiving of it was that no matter really whatever career path you choose, you're probably going to forego going out every Friday night to get drunk to, you know, well, there's opportunity. You can look at, but so then you could look at opportunity, opportunity cost, opportunity cost is yes. an interesting term. It's not even that is I have like calling it a cost is a little tricky cost is a. T- I haven't thought of how to use cost perfectly, but I'm a little uncomfortable with how widely it's used. Cause it's like, it's like sometimes, like sometimes actually you take a harm versus sometimes it's just what resources you give, which is right. this, like, okay, I get like the cost of this, like, oh, even people talk about like, oh, I got sick and that was a cost versus, oh, I just paid a hundred dollars. Like those aren't quite the same. So that's the thing. I don't have, I don't have the answer to how to use it properly, but yeah, yeah. I just, I, I have, I, my, my unclarity sensor is up with. with yeah. That. I, I guess in the, just the, through the economic lens, it's is it productive or consumptive behavior? Is kind of the line, right? Like if you're if you're saving, um, incurring opportunity cost or sacrificing whatever but we're going to call it here. Opportunity cost with everything, right? Right, but of consumption and production, and I mean, if you use it in the broadest sense of there are alternatives, there are alternative uses of. Every yeah, yeah. time resources. So it's like, yeah, I'm you know, right now it's like, okay, I'm I'm doing this. I could be doing anything else that I have the so means to do. What is then how would you define or properly use the term sacrifice? Would you use it in any well, economic I mean, we'll, context? We'll, we'll, I mean, I think of it as the surrender of of value. Like but you know, mm. prop, in the economic like the business gives us a good term, which is a loss. Yeah. So it's like you're taking a loss. So yeah. If you, it's it's useful. Like profit is a great term. I mean, it's of course it's so central to Austrian economics in particular, but just the idea of like new value was added. And mm-hmm. you can think of it as like, okay, because we're always investing, we're always investing our time, energy, you know, resources that have been created by previous time mm-hmm. and energy. Like we're always doing that. And so the key thing is like from a self-interest perspective is like, is this the most beneficial thing? But it's it's a long range pursuit. So that's why you have this issue of investment and time preference and all mm-hmm. of these things. But I think it's very important to not at all obscure the issue of like, are you concerned about benefiting or do you believe that you have to, you have to like surrender your life or some part of it. And that that gets deliberately obscured because mm. again, it's very hard to argue, hey, your life belongs to everyone else or your life belongs to unimpacted nature, which is the environmental version, which is even worse. But that's really hard to, to just say on its own. But if you package it together with like, oh, we all need to sacrifice. And look, you sacrificed to learn a lot about Bitcoin because you could have been mm-hmm. shooting up cocaine or something like that. Right, right, it's just right, a total, right. it's a total mess. So I, I think of, yeah, I would put it as, like it is controversial. I said, like I, I don't sacrifice, or maybe more accurately, like I don't deliberately sacrifice. Right. But sometimes I do things, and I think that was not. I mean, it happens all the time. I think, oh, if I knew now, if I knew then what I know now, I would not have done this. Yeah. But but I'm at least trying to pursue self interest, and th- there's a lot of interesting kind of questions of okay, how does this deal with like in relationships, and how does it deal with family? But I, I would just submit that with all of those. There are mutually beneficial ways of, of pursuing them, mm. but they do involve, particularly when you're talking about family, like it involves a very long range perspective. And often people who are kind of, a lot of people are offended by the idea that you don't need to sacrifice. Like they take it personally. And I think they're, they might be bitter about their own sacrifice. They're like, well, mm. it's, it was necessary. It's just like, oh, well, how could you have a, how could you have children without sacrificing? Mm. Well, but it depends. like you can choose to have children. And you're basically signing this contract that you're agreeing to. Mm-hmm. And you're saying like, hey, this time, yeah, I'm going to spend time changing diapers and doing this stuff. And I want that, like that overall experience to me, like that is totally worth it to me, given my alternatives. Right. And I think, and and but you would, you would appear to be with people who don't have the categories, right? You would, they'd say like, oh, you're such, you're so selfless. Like you're such a good parent. Cause they have the idea of selfish means you don't care about anything. 
you're totally short range. But I, I know parents who consider themselves totally self-interested. They're very devoted parents, but it's because they chose this. Right. And then they're fulfilling it and it satisfies them. So one of my, you know, one of my themes is that people don't, in general, like the idea of being pro-human is very caricatured. People want to caricature pro-human as being anti-environment. Because mm-hmm, if, mm-hmm. if they if they can't caricature it, then they right. can't refute it. Yeah. And But more narrowly, being self-interested is caricatured. Because if you actually understand what it means to be self-interested, there's no argument against it. Because it's just good for everyone. Yeah. Interesting. So I've always conceived of the term sacrifice. Actually, it's not even a negative. It's just something you selectively do to negotiate with your future what about self? human sacrifice like well I, i'm thinking again through the economics lens clearly a human sacrifice would be like another category of where right but um, see it's like i don't like things that are that even yeah. like okay yeah female genital mutilation like she gets sacrificed to that dogma and then like oh yeah i invest in my career so that's so i think it's so i i don't i, I don't think you find this annoying but I, you probably noticed like I'm no, very I appreciate the precision deliberate of language. about terminology. Well, that's why I'm it's digging like, into it, yeah. And I think what I want to stress is that these package deals are everywhere. Mm. And I think a lot of it is actually because people don't have clear concepts of, of self-interest and self-sacrifice. And mm-hmm. that, that tends to bleed into everything. So I think most right. of these, like you can't think like you, self-interest is necessary. I mean, to a certain extent for everybody. And so like, if you don't have, if you don't clearly even think about things in self-interest and self-sacrifice, then you're just going to be like, all of your categories are going to be very muddled and you're never even going to know what you're doing. Like, yeah. are you doing this for you or are you doing this because it's, it's good to sacrifice you? Right. Like You don't even know. It's like, what does it mean? Like you think about friendship and you're like, Oh, I'm a good friend, but you don't even have an idea of like, is this something that is really like, am I doing this because it's, like this is a real benefit to my life. Looking in the full thing of it, not just yeah. in a moment, but like, is this good for my life? And am I pursuing it accordingly, or is it just like, oh, friendship is a thing, and sometimes it's for me, and sometimes it's for them, and and I think most people can't think of it. I yeah. shouldn't say most people, but like they can't think of it any more precisely than that, and it causes right. so much suffering because how can you possibly make decisions if you don't know what your goal is? You just end up being just like random and then resenting a lot of stuff. I'm a little bit muddied, even even if we throw out the term sacrifice, because Mm -hmm. what I was thinking is you could have a significant financial loss, for instance, Mm -hmm. that could be also simultaneously be a tremendous psychological gain in the long run, right? Maybe you maybe you were an entrepreneur, your business imploded, you learned a whole treasure trove of lessons that carried you forward some other way in life. So how do you, does loss give us the right term here or do we have to just specify no, what it's type not, of gain it's not, or loss no, 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 is? No, 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 no. Well, it's, it's the idea of taking a loss or it's, mm. you can think of it as like deliberately taking a loss. So the idea of sacrifice, so you can think of, there's, there's a concept of benefit. And so that mm. pertains to the result of yep. it. And what sacrifices and self-interest versus self-sacrifice is getting to is, is the intention of mm, selfish is, or selfless. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And I okay. like both okay. of those terms, as long as you use yeah. them cleanly yes. and you don't assume that selfish means yes. you're a jerk, which right. I, I don't, I, I'm happy to use selfish, but it's just yeah. like selfish just means you benefit. And yeah. then you have to study what that means. And I think the way you benefit is by being a creator in harmony with others, not being an exploiter and yes. putting yourself at war uh, with others. Yeah. So that's the intention. And then you can, it's some, you know, sometimes people will talk. So you need to separate the intention from the result. And the idea is the intention in right. general leads to the result, but doesn't guarantee the result. And you can always make up a scenario where acting on like a self-sacrificial intention will get some results. So you could say like, oh, well, I was, I decided to become a rabbi for, you know, to please my mom. Again, this isn't a real thing she wanted me to do, but then, but on the way to the rabbinical school, I discovered a million dollars on the street. Mm. So wasn't it a great idea? And you're like, that's ridiculous. That's not, well, A, so A, if you're living by self-sacrifice, the million dollars doesn't even matter. You're still going to throw away your life in all sorts of ways. Yeah. But B, like morality principles in general, they're not valid or in, they're not valid or invalid based on whether acting on them sort of works hundred percent of the time. They're identifying causal relationships that that are useful to you. So in general, mm-hmm. yes, if you are like with your career, like if you independently choose your career, 
that is going to give you a chance at picking a career that's rewarding. It doesn't say that it's guaranteed. Mm -hmm. And if you if you are intellectually dependent or second-handed about your career, that means that you are going to not pick something that's fulfilling to you. Uh, you have very low chance of doing it. And then even if you do, you're going to pursue it in a way that's not uh, as fulfilling as it could be. But it doesn't say that you won't find a million dollars on the way. It doesn't say anything about that. So sometimes yeah. people just have this idea of like, but so it's, you want to focus on like, what's my intention? And then yeah. what principles am I following? And are those the best principles to maximize my chances of right. the intention? Gotcha. So then is this the magic of successful market action? Because you've combined the selfish pursuit of profits with a selfless result, like you know, if you if you're again Jeff Bezos, right, pursuing the capitalist incentive, but he created a selfless result for the world. Well, you can think of all... it as a selfish result. I mean, it's two selfish people. Right, trade is just two selfish people. Mm. So then, so you're thinking you need to understand the other person's selfishness to be selfish yourself. Mm. It's like customer obsession, right? It's not customer sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Like obsessed with what's in the interest of the, and this is where service is another package deal that I hate. Mm. I mean, service product or service is a great concept, but there'll be like, oh, I'm a servant. I like serve the consumer. It's like, you no, know, there's a difference between, you know, somebody during Jim Crow who was forced to be a servant in some way. was not like, that's bad. Mm -hmm. Right. Or like the servitude of slavery yeah. versus like, no, you perform a service and, Right. You know, it's it's a broad term. I mean, it just yeah. means to confer some benefit, but there is it's being used in very compelled or non-compelled, right? Voluntary yeah, and also, and voluntary. Well, also, well, also, yeah, beneficial, like yeah. self-interested or or self-sacrificial, and I think it leads to a lot of there's just so much disingenuousness from people about motives. Yeah, it's just like people will say, like you'll see these executives, they'll say like. Oh, I just live to serve the consumer and just meet the people. And I think this is not at all what you do. Yeah. Like, the, and it's in and, and Ayn Rand's other most famous book, The Fountainhead, which is also amazing. Like, the hero of it is an architect, and he provides an amazing service. I mean, he's this great architect, but he's he's very explicit. Like, hey, I'm doing it because I love the work. So I think of it. You know, you think of how how a division of labor society works. Like the selfish, how it works is the self-interest. So there's the self-interest of, I think the ultimate self-interest is you enjoy the work. Uh, you find the, re you find the, the, so you, you like the process of doing the work. Yeah. You believe that the work is valuable to others. So you think it's in their yeah. self-interest. So like with my ideas, I think very strongly that if other people adopt my ideas, my ideas can be really good for them. Right. That is very, if I thought it was poisoning them or poisoning the planet, I would not, be satisfying to me because yeah. I would then I would know I'm not a creator. I'm just an exploiter or, or a fraud. So there's yeah. that self-interest. There's a self-interest of working with people that you enjoy with, that you enjoy working with. And that's a lot of the enjoyment of work, I think, is just that ideas, you know, it's kind of like you, you enjoy podcasts, right? You get to talk to people and it's yeah. fun. It's very satisfying. And then there's the enjoyment uh, and value you get from the financial reward of it. And you think that, okay, on the consumer end, there's also, there's a self-interest that you identified and you're thinking about the product and that's part of what makes it meaningful to you. But then there's also just the value that they get from it. So if it's a, you know, if it's a trip that we have trips to space now, which I think is very exciting. Like if it's trip to space, yeah, it's a once in a lifetime, hopefully in the future, more than once in a lifetime experience. And it's, so everyone is getting value. But right. so the thing about self-interest is it's always caricatured as short range, sacrificial, mm. stupid, uh, like unemotional. And it's all these things. Whereas really, if you think consistently about it, it's no, you need to be very thoughtful about yourself. You need to be very thoughtful about others. And if human beings are a source of value, you need to think a lot about how to relate to them in a mutually beneficial way. Right. But unfortunately, the advocacy of sacrifice, and this has such a long legacy, it the people advocating sacrifice are always trying to disguise it as in your interest. And they're trying to disguise self-interest as not being in your interest. So that's the irony. Right. right. It's like, it's like, Oh, being selfish. It, ultimately the argument is it's bad for you. Yeah. And the, uh, and there's a kind of, well, you're going to be punished in, 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 you know, the afterlife, but then there's also like, no, you're going to be punished in this life. Cause no one's going to like you, but yeah. then it's not selfish. So it's really like to be selfish to think about what will actually be in your interest, long range, 
with other people. That And self-sacrifice just means taking a loss. It's the exact same thing with the environmental stuff. Like ultimately the argument of so much of the environmental stuff is we will flourish by our eliminating our impact on nature. That's right. like what it's like. Which is eliminating ourselves effectively. Yes, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We will, we will, we will help ourselves by eliminating our means of survival and yeah. therefore ourselves. But it's, you see how it's disguised that way. People think, yeah, yeah like opposing all this energy, yeah, it's going to be really good for us. And yeah. yeah, if we use all this energy, it's going to be really bad. And this is part of, you know, in, in moral case chapter one, I have a lot of these catastrophe predictions historically. Yes. Yes. And, you know, that's all delicate nurturer that, yeah. but that's, that's part of how it's put over. Like the people leading this, like you look at these guys like Paul Ehrlich, John Holdren, some of these names you'll see if, if I think you can read the first chapter for free on Amazon. Like you just see this, like a lot of them know, they don't think that they're leading to global human flourishing mm -hmm. by pushing for rapid reduction of fossil fuel use in the seventies of all times. Right. They don't think, they don't really think that, but they, they're pretty avowed about, they think the earth has too many people, we should live with less. You know, even Bill McKibben at his most pro-human pro moments says the average, the proper standard of living is somewhere between the average Englishman and the average Ethiopian. It's almost a wow. direct quote from him. So it's, it's like, but they know that if they, if they are honest about what it means to eliminate our impact, and that means really eliminating us, certainly eliminating our ability to flourish, like nobody's going to want it. Mm -hmm. So they put it over as if you don't do what we say, you're going to go to hell. That's global warming or global cooling or these mm -hmm. other catastrophes. And then if you do what we say, somehow we're going to live this nice life in harmony with nature and we won't have these bad wildfires and we'll have plenty of water and there won't be drought. And, and it's just a total evasion of the fact that life was really bad for the average person until we massively transformed nature yeah. using a lot of energy and a lot of machines. So, so I'd like a couple of, a couple of two part question, let's say. So one is this idea of service, whether it's self seeking or self interested versus self sacrificial. Mm -hmm. So if we have government sitting on top of us, controlling money, they're inflating mm -hmm. or taxing us in a non consensual way. I guess that's the modern form of servitude, right? That we actually live in servitude to the government. So I just wanted to that was a well, there are many, many forms of that. I mean, I mean, the, yeah. you know, I'd say the two broadest, I mean, maybe, maybe there are three, but the most obvious are taxation and control, which is often called yeah. regulation, but I think that's yeah. too nice a term. Control. So you Agreed. think of it as, as it's, as it's right. So it's, it's, I mean, taxation is, I mean, let's just say taxation for things that have nothing to do with protecting your rights. Yeah. So that is just your, like literally your life is going toward something that you don't want it to go to. And it's this irreplaceable thing. The only kind of hack, the only hack that I have, and it's not an ideal hack, but for me, it's just like, if you can pick work, if you really like work and you can predict and you can pick work that you would do, even if you were independently wealthy that, yeah. and, and you can make decent money with it, which is, I try to do all three of those, then, then you don't, you suffer the least from it because then like, then you're, your time isn't taken from you in the same way because you mm -hmm. still choose to do the work. Now, what you can do with your time has changed. Like you can't live in as nice a place mm -hmm. and you can, you know, unless you're just incredibly productive, like you can't live in as nice a place and you can't do as much of the recreational time, but you can still like do quite a bit. So for instance, I choose to live in California. It costs me a bunch, but I like Laguna beach a lot. And mm -hmm. I don't like, like there's nowhere in Texas right now that I feel like, Oh, that's worth like, I'll, I'll pay a lot of money to California to do this. So anyway, yeah. that's, that's, but it, but nevertheless, it is still servitude. It's like, cause, and I could be doing a lot more with the money and most people are in a much worse situation for, for many reasons. Right. Like most people, it's just literally, they end up doing a lot of work that they would rather not do. Uh, and it's just gone forever to serve the and, government. And it, yeah. But, 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 you know, with the idea of they have a sacrificial obligation to mm. others. I mean, the government is all about, it's all about the others, right? It's not, yes. they just said, oh, it's us. And it's just the politicians. It wouldn't be so, it wouldn't yeah. have the same appeal, but if it's wouldn't, like others. Yeah. But again, if you're, if you look at that accurately and it's like sacrificing the productive to the unproductive, then it's, it's less uh, appealing. Right. And then of course, control is, you know, it's, 
it's in some ways even worse. I mean, it's saying like with all of your time, like insofar as their control, it's like all of your time, you have to serve the judgment or whim of government. So mm -hmm. if you decide, so for example, if California says we're going to cut off your electricity after five, it's like, no matter what I think, I'm not allowed to do it. So it's like my life is, it's, it's not mine. I, I have some control, at least with this level of control, with totalitarianism, you have none. But it's like, to some degree, it's like I'm, I'm helping myself, but I'm also sacrificing to government. So I don't use, I realize now as we're talking about this, I don't use the term serve a lot hmm. uh, because it's so ambiguous. So right. I do sacrifice uh, a lot because I just really want to stress, like, I'm not, there's not, I'm not choosing this. It's not benefiting mm. me and I don't want to do it. So that's why you put taxation, inflation, control is sa well, sacrifice. Coerced sacrifice. Yeah. Coerced gotcha. sacrifice. They're, I mean, they're involuntary there, but they're, but you know, one thing that's when you have sacrifice as the dominant morality, then we yeah. vote it a lot. And then it gets, I mean, it's not just voted, it's, it's voted self-righteously. Right. And that's, that's the really scary part where it's just really like right now we're talking about, what is it? 3.5 trillion infrastructure. And it's like such a joke. And it, most of it has nothing to do with, first of all, I don't think that the government should control most of this in quote infrastructure that it does. Agreed. Anyway. Yeah. But it's, it's not even like, and the idea that government roads vindicate government control and that private <laughs> roads, like that's crazy. But the I mean, I get that people think that that's a controversial view that that roads should be private. I think yeah. if you go into it, it's pretty obvious yes. that they should be, but in any case, they even call it like human infrastructure. They'll say like, so basically infrastructure just means anything we want to do. Yes. It's like the infrastructure, right. there's conventional infrastructure, which is already too broad. And then there's human infrastructure, which is just everything we feel like doing. And, but it's really pitched as, oh, we're going to sort of, we're getting together $3.5 trillion and we're going to serve the people. To make you America just look at the reality. <laughs> you just look at the reality of that. And it's just like, you're taking these people's time and choice. Yes. Away from them. And right. like that's what you're doing. And then you're acting like without you, they would just be helpless. Yeah. It's so that's where I mean, I think those are great points. And that's where I view Bitcoin actually. And it's funny, you're you're reframing my use of this word sacrifice, where in the past I've described fiat currency as money that's produced without the requisite sacrifice. Like to go mine gold, you had to go expend energy and incur cost to create it. Bitcoin has a similar proof of work. Right. It's without the requisite investment, I would say. Yeah. Requisite cost investment. Um, but that that is the reason it fails, actually. It's because there's no, the, you know, if the marginal cost of production is near zero, the marginal, the market price of that good being produced will converge to zero, essentially, over long enough time horizon. And then, so now I'm thinking that it needs to be framed that way as cost instead of sacrifice. But th so then that means that Bitcoin is a way to opt out of the self-sacrifice because you can actually hold the money that's not inflating. You can opt out of inflation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and so far as it works, it's great. I mean, there's, you know, you worry about like government crackdowns and stuff, but yeah, conceptually, I also said well, you said something. The uninflatability like we need to do. definitely works. That's the only thing yeah. you know that it works. No, yeah. no, 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 no. I'm saying, no, no, I'm not. Not, I'm not questioning that aspect. I'm just saying, like, governments, you know, like, what are governments going to do to torture people? Right, and like, right, to what right, extent? Right. You know, so even thinking about, like, even, um, you know, thinking about getting Bitcoin myself and, like, okay, do I go on Coinbase? Do I get my own thing? And, like, mm -hmm. then I'm worried about, okay, if I get it on Coinbase, that seems easy. But then, like, KYC. is yeah. there just going to be this huge control? So it's, it's there, like there, that's to me is a lot of the ambiguity is just what are governments. And I, the savvier people I'm sure have taken many precautions against that. And I'm sure there are best practices mm -hmm. about that, that I'm not uh, familiar with. And hopefully they're easier than I think they are. Cause they seem odorous to me, which is part of like a, a deterrent uh, to it, but it's yeah. Yeah. No, but I mean, I said it would be great. Like in so far, like, look, in so far as we can freely create things that insulate ourselves from government coercion, that is great because mm -hmm. the business I'm in is I'm trying to persuade people who have been, in my view, largely indoctrinated by yes. a very powerful system that has yeah. a lot of incentives to keep doing what it's doing and That's... more. And I'm pretty happy that I'm able to persuade more and more people given that. Yeah. But if there were a way to like create your own independent energy world, you know, that would be 
really great. Even even you think of something like it, it, it's not it can't be as not quote non physical as Bitcoin. Although obviously Bitcoin is very physical in terms of making it. Mm-hmm. But you think about like oh, if you could just have like a home nuclear reactor box that was cost effective, I would love that. I mean, any and it could even be that the more statism you have, the more you the more you are in incent- the more incentivization you have to these um like indep- more kind of independent types of value because there's right. a grid is an amazing thing and there are a lot of reasons to want one it's one of the great achievements yeah. but if you think if you if that gets coupled with the degree of government control over it it right. may be oh you want to pay twice as much for your nuclear box that nobody can screw with now unfortunately there's there's unfortunately not something that's only twice as much expensive that's a nuclear box but and of course, they restrict nuclear, so you, they basically criminalize it, so you can't even develop that, yeah. which is the real sca- one of the real scandals here. But yeah, I, like stuff like Bitcoin, the one I first learned about it, it was very exciting for for many reasons, like to have a much better currency, to have a, a free currency, yeah. free, free market currency, but also this idea of it seemed like oh, you can get around a significant amount of government coercion versus convincing the government to withdraw itself from money, which right. seems even more far-fetched than getting it to, much more far-fetched, I should say, than, than getting it to change its views on energy. Absolutely. Totally makes sense. Um, and I, I'm excited to see how these two worlds collide, where actually the existence of Bitcoin may you know, incentivize the development of actual, actually cost-effective energy resources versus the whatever the environmentalists Yeah, have I, I think so. I mean, be. there's a lot of... I mean, the thing is, so Bitcoin uses electricity and electricity is incredibly government controlled Mm -hmm. and the subject of just unbelievable fraudulent claims. Um, I'm trying to think of how people can find this. If you, I don't know how well Google works for Twitter, but I posted, maybe I'll send it to you later. um, But I I posted a thing on Twitter a while back, which is like my intro for people in Bitcoin to kind of my work on energy. And just, these are the things I think you need to know. And part of what I was getting at is just, understanding the amount of fraud in terms of describing electricity. And and the genesis of this is that electricity is like, it's like one giant machine. So the grid you can think of as one giant machine that has all of these inputs and all of these outputs and all of these components connecting the inputs and the outputs. So you imagine with government in control of that, and then people with, I would say, very questionable motives, imagine how arbitrary you can be in ascribing cost to things mm, right like you can just say like the solar you yeah yeah well you you can but just well but that's that's part of it but it's it's like you take solar you can just claim oh solar is really cheap but mm-hmm. maybe you only look at the cost of the panels but you don't mm. look at the system costs of making the panels work and so right. it's it's at the point of fraud where most of the leading companies now claim that they are powered by 100% renewable electricity, mm. which is completely physically impossible and doesn't happen anywhere, particularly with solar and wind. And it's just, they literally do it by paying the grid to give others the blame for their coal, oil, gas, or the coal, gas, and nuclear use and giving them credit for others. Like it is literally, my analogy wow. is it's, it's like Tim Cook is taking uh, a yacht across the ocean and it has a sail on it and that provides 10% of its energy. And then he gets the accountant to say, oh, Tim got across the ocean on the sail and everyone else got across the ocean on the oil. Like it's, right. it's literally that ridiculous. I mean, there, there are some variations of it. Like yeah, they add yeah. their own unreliable energy, but still the, the point is you're using reliable energy and you're claiming that the unreliable energy works. So there's there's so much. And so this, this is relevant to Bitcoin because I already see a lot of lying going on in terms of people claiming, oh, like I'm using renewable, I'm carbon neutral. I don't yeah, believe yeah. any of those. Yeah. I mean, and I, I don't believe, I know that they're not, they're not true. And that should just, I, I, more, I think my post started with something like Bitcoin stands for honest money. Mm-hmm. And so it should really be honest about energy. So I do think there are real opportunities to innovate, particularly you know, you have stuff like what Marty Bent is doing, I think, with, you know, mining, like what would be like stranded natural gas. Like there yeah. are some really cool things. So yeah. I do think there's potential, but it is unfortunately in the context of grid, I wouldn't say economics, but grid accounting fraud. Mm, and so there's gotcha. a lot of that that's permeated the Bitcoin world. I so that, But I still think there's potential for me, the most exciting thing, because I've been on a number of Bitcoin podcasts now, is I just think that 
Bitcoin, because it's this exciting value that taps into very legitimate concerns people have and aspirations they have, has gotten a lot of smart people to think about new ideas, including Austrian economics. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also leading people to rethink their ideas on energy and to be exposed mm -hmm. in particular to the humanistic perspective on energy. Because Bitcoin is so under attack by this anti-impact movement. And so yeah. the, a lot of the response, initial response was, oh, let's make terms with them and let's pledge to be renewable. And I'm, do not do that. That's not going to work. And you're just going to be lying about things. And that you don't want to be lying about things when you're trying to pioneer something that you think is is uh, honest. So that's, yeah, that's, that's the danger. But the good thing is there are lots of people who are, who see this attack as a real attack and who say like, there's something wrong with this. There's something wrong that there's something as potentially valuable as Bitcoin. And yet all people are talking about is like, what is it doing to the climate? And then you can sort mm -hmm. of get, wait, why are they looking at the whole world that way? We have this amazing machine filled world yeah. which does all this work for us and frees us up to engage in all of this incredibly productive and, and uh, meaningful me mental labor. Yeah. And the whole focus is let's stop impacting climate even though impacting climate is inextricably intertwined with our whole way of, of life. And I think oh, people yes. are, and it, yeah. especially you learn, oh wait, we're safer from climate than ever thanks to these machines. And then you really think, okay, it's not about at all a livable climate. Yeah. It's about an unimpacted climate because it's this God of an unimpacted planet. And it's really just this anti-human primitive religion right. that disguises itself by claiming to be for a good environment and by putting forward this delicate nurture view which is the most unscientific view you could ever imagine. That's yeah, I want I wonder if the continued success of Bitcoin so it keeps driving towards lower cost energy sources. I wonder if that mm -hmm. honesty of capitalistic accounting, right, just the competition in the industry sort of imposes itself and compares itself to other uses of energy such that other, so that maybe we cut through some of this grid accounting distortion you described. I, well, but the thing is so you can you know, they have these things called power purchase agreements, Yeah, which is just, so there's, again, it's all one machine. And so there's this, these terrible dynamics of people are, we talk about sacrificing some to others, like sacrifice is just constantly occurring on the grid mm -hmm. in terms of some people being screwed and right, some people right, benefit. Right, right. Yeah. So what you can do is you can sign up for, an, you can have an agreement where you say like, hey, I'm going to buy like, Some I'm going to buy amount. X amount of electricity yeah. and it's all going to come from solar. And you just, yeah. how could that possibly, how could it all come from solar? Yeah. There's nighttime, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it's, but yet you have these things and people act like they're real. They act like they're real. Gotcha. Whereas in reality, the grid is just, it's always just everyone is getting whatever mixture is on the grid. Right. So there's 33% coal. Like you're using 33% coal. You can lie about it, but you're doing that. And so unfortunately, particularly in the, you know, the wealthier countries where all these dynamics are going on, there is that going on. Uh, if you, if you imagine if it was all the way it would be perfect, this is not ideal, but it would be perfect accounting wise. If everybody had to have a self-contained electricity generation system connected to a Bitcoin miner, mm -hmm. then you would have perfect. I don't, I don't like the term perfect competition, but then you'd yeah. have like total competition, right? Because there would be no way to distort the accounting. Right. Um, that makes sense. So I think I think that, but that said, there are still some. The 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 honesty though comes with at a certain point, that, like in California, you know, the prices go up if you use more of these unreliables, and then there you get some pressure on these sweetheart deals as people become aware of them because the consumers say, "Hey, wait, I'm paying this fortune, and this company like Amazon is getting it super cheap." Well, that's not fair, and so then they need to jack up Amazon's rates or jack up this Bitcoin mining. Uh, mm. Companies rates. Also, probably Bitcoin miners are not going to be looked at that favorably by governments yeah. going forward. So it's another reason why you should what you should not support this fraudulent system and just try to game it and make all these claims. You should advocate for energy freedom and really advocate for like energy is great. The world needs to be using a lot more energy. I mean, we haven't talked about it yet, but you know, three billion people have virtually no energy. Like yeah. A better world is, and nobody talks about them. And it's because we're not a society that actually values human flourishing. Like we think we are. And I yeah. think we are when it's made explicit. Yeah. But our, 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 our default operating framework is to just be focused on eliminating our impact, particularly CO2. Yeah. And it's just criminal to me that nobody, 
Nobody talks about billions of people are still like desperately poor in ways that none of us, including no environmental activists that I've ever met, would ever accept. Right. And so people talk about like catastrophe apocalypse. Like my view is that half the world lives in an apocalypse. Right. Right. Now. Right. 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 And and so the idea of the whole focus of let's get rid of the CO2 of the only energy that works. I think it's such an anti-human focus, but again, it's disguised as, oh, we well, we just want to prevent a climate catastrophe, but like, wait a second, what about preventing a nature catastrophe of not being productive? Yeah. That's like, that's the real catastrophe is not being productive. And to be productive, you need energy. And most people don't, are still not using very much energy. Love it. I, you know, and your book opens with a very visceral example of that, um, about, you know, not having an incubator to keep a child alive. So I, man, this has been awesome conversation. We're coming up on two and a half hours. I want to be respectful of your time. Love to have you back. Uh, we barely scratched the surface <laughs> at all in your book. I think, uh, we got a, let me just think, is there anything, I just want to think, is there anything that I can say in a minute that I feel like we definitely missed? Cause I feel like, I guess the only thing is that I was so say covered, the, the failed predictions I thought were really interesting over the past 50 years. Yeah, I mean, that that is pretty easy. I think that's pretty easy for, I'm just trying to think of what are hard for people to validate. Yes, yeah, so if you look at like, again, if you look at Amazon, I think you just read the first chapter of my book, like you see those. But again, yeah, they're catastrophic resource depletion, catastrophic pollution, catastrophic global cooling, catastrophic global warming. And again, it's, I want to emphasize catastrophic. So it's not that mm. those are there are no real dynamics there, but the idea that they're catastrophic, that we can't do anything about them. Yeah. Um, that's what's really wrong. And, and I would say that's attached that to this idea of the delicate nurture, which I don't focus on much in moral case. I focus much more in my next book, Fossil Future, which will be out in February about that. And you can't order that on Amazon yet, but uh, oh, I should say if, yeah, if anyone wants to follow my stuff, just go to uh, the easiest way is just go to the website, energytalkingpoints.com. And that has a lot of my current commentary. And then you can sign up for my mailing list there. So that's just energytalkingpoints.com. I think, and with climate, so we talked a lot about like, for me, you can think about like the livability of climate is the function of the specific, the climate conditions of the time. Mm -hmm. And then our climate mastery ability. And the point I've stressed is like climate mastery ability is what matters most. Climate conditions are naturally dangerous. They're naturally dynamic. They're naturally mm -hmm. diverse. Uh, mastery is what matters most. And I think the only thing I would stress is there is no evidence at all so you could imagine a hypothetical that the CO2 emissions would be rising in such a way that it would be like a totally unprecedented set of climate conditions that we couldn't live in. So imagine that, okay, it's 50 degrees warmer, something like that. Mm -hmm. It's 50 degrees warmer at the equator, uh, you know, centralized in the earth, like something like that. So we can't, philosophically, you can't rule that out, but you can rule that out just looking at the at the history of the earth and the nature of what's called the greenhouse effect. So, the earth has been around for a while. We have a lot of records of what it used to be like. And first of all, we know it's been around for a lot while it hasn't been destroyed, but more to the point, we've had more than 10 times the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere and life flourished during that amount of time. And mm. it's been 25 degrees Fahrenheit warmer. And it doesn't always correlate at all to the CO2, by the way, which is interesting. So we yeah. know we've had 10 times more CO2. We have no ability to get there even if we wanted to. We know that life on this earth flourished when it's 25 degrees warmer on average, in part because when the earth warms, it warms more in colder places. So global mm. warming isn't quite accurate. It's more polar warming, which is why you hear all this stuff about the Arctic, but that's actually good. Mm. Like it's warmer there versus in like in Siberia versus, oh, it's getting super warm at the equator. Right, so once right. you sort of learn that, okay, we're not in unprecedented territory. We're the most adaptable species ever. We can't get the earth anywhere near to even its normal range where life did well. The only real question about our impacts is, are we causing a rate of change that's overly disruptive? So there's no, no possibility of the earth is going to be uninhabitable. The only hypothetical, once you understand a little bit about the earth, is, is it going to be, is the rate of change going to be a problem? But mm -hmm. even that should take it out of the category of apocalypse. And it's more just like, okay, could it be a big problem, which is different from we're all going to die. And, you know, the most plausible thing there is sea levels. Because sea levels, mm -hmm. yeah, you do build up your civilization near the coast and that kind of thing. But if you look at sea level rises, like it, right now it's at a rate of one foot a century, like one mm -hmm. foot a century. Over 100 million people already live below sea level. So we have a lot of ways of living below sea level. The more catastrophic estimates are, you know, three feet in a century if we, quote, do nothing, 
which for me means do the right thing and use a lot more energy. And then they'll say, like the UN will say it's 18 inches if we impose the Green New Deal and in my view, destroy everyone. So like three feet in a hundred years, that is not, that's not even that disruptive. If you think about right. how much wealth in a free society is produced, even in the last 25 or 30 years and how much people move. So what you really, and it's, this can be hard to believe unless you understand how important the this, the framework is, our starting points. Because remember I said at the beginning, I think this idea of the goal, our goal and our premise about how the world works, like that's 90% of this. And so I'm just coming full circle to that. Like, I don't think it's about the facts because I think when you look at the facts from the perspective of advancing human flourishing in the world is wild potential. Like it's mm -hmm. pretty clear that the benefit of this is like an amazing, an amazing world for like I think of it as like a nourishing, safe, opportunity-filled world for more and more people. Like that's what we have and that's what we want to expand. So that's the benefit is really like a livable world as we know it and as could be improved. And then the negative side, all this other side effects besides CO2, they shrink over time. Uh, so, and they, they were even worth it in the 1800s, but they're certainly worth it now and you can manage them in different ways. The only side effect to be at all concerned about is CO2 because it aggregates over time. It like soot and stuff, you know, that, that'll that like go up and then it'll disappear. Yeah. But CO2 adds up. So that's right. legitimate to explore. But again, if you look at it, it's like, it's not unprecedented. It's going to probably make the world a little bit more tropical. Uh, there are going to be clear benefits to that, certainly in terms of plant growth. There'll be clear benefits in terms of lower cold-related deaths and cold-related yeah. deaths exceed heat-related deaths by a factor of 10. So in all honesty, it's probably better given the, it, the rate is not that fast. Mm. It's probably better even on its own. Like probably you would wish, even if there were no energy associated with the CO2, you would probably wish for it. Now, right. I don't know if, I can't validate that. And there's some case to say, well, there's some uncertainty around it, so I wouldn't wish for that. But then again, you're losing a hell of a lot of plant growth if you don't have that CO2. And right. that matters a lot. So I would say if it were just CO2 and we had a humanistic discussion, we would have a robust debate about, do we want to, if we could put CO2 in the air for free, which essentially we've done with fossil fuels, like if somebody said, hey, we can increase the CO2 from 0.03% to 0.05%, like I think that would be the subject of robust public debate mm. and you would have a decent case on both sides. But see how far that is from an apocalypse. Right, right, right. We know that CO2, which has a lot of benefits and has maybe some harms, we know that comes with A, the ability to neutralize all climate danger, including any climate. So it comes with all these climate mastery benefits that totally over neutralize and overwhelm it. And then it comes from the benefit of everything else in the world being livable. So it's so straightforward. So we're sort of coming at like, yes, like the overall view is fossil fuels are taking a livable planet and making it unlivable. And like mm -hmm. my view is no, fossil fuels are taking an unlivable planet and making it livable. Mm -hmm. And that's why I say it all comes down yeah. to, is your goal a livable planet for human beings or is it an unimpacted planet by human beings. Right. And if and if your goal is a level planet for human beings, you're clear on that. And then you're clear that, yeah, the planet is wild potential. It needs to be drastically and intelligently impacted. Like once you get that, it's pretty clear that fossil fuels are amazing and can be more amazing still. But it's sort of wild how much depends on the starting points. Yeah. Right? So we go back to first principles, right? right? In that sense, like the 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 primary principles you're bringing in terms of what's your goal, what's your assumption about how the world works. And then also I would add, um, you could think of it as your method. Like, are you weighing benefits and side effects carefully? That right. flows from the first two, but it's important. Like yeah. if you're doing those three things with the right goal, the right view of how the world works, and you're looking you're looking at the full context, you're weighing benefits and side effects. The right accounting, yeah. Like it's, it's just amazing. It's not even like a borderline thing. It's like so dramatic. And this is a weird thing that I have where I don't, like, I don't, like to be controversial. Like my goal is never like, I want to be a controversial. It's just like, I have this weird thing because I have this view that's controversial, but to me, it's so obvious, right. but I know why it's not obvious, but it's not obvious because of the philosophy. Yeah. It's, 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 everyone is processing it in what I think is the wrong way. So this is probably somewhere you yeah. identify with Bitcoiners because we, a lot of us feel the same way. Like the corrupt money is the core of many of the problems, which it yeah, sounds like there's a lot like, of overlap here. Yeah, and I think it's it's um, yeah, I think so. And, it, you, and particularly, it seems like people see, yeah, the government. You know, without the government wisely controlling the money supply, everything would collapse and the economy mm -hmm. wouldn't work. 
and you're viewing it as no, don't you see all the destruction and injustice that is perpetrated by arbitrary control uh, of this and not allowing yeah. individuals to choose what kind That's of right. money. And so it's, you get to, it's like, it's, it's again, anywhere, the anywhere anti-human is... thing portrays itself as exactly as pro-human. And then you yes. conclude, but if you think it's anti-human, then it's like you have this total Copernican revolution right. or crackpot theory, depending on the perspective of the audience. Yes. It's like anywhere you see coercion or compulsion, you have capital misallocation and, you know, capital misallocation, I could, you could argue is an anti-human viewpoint. You're basically saying that you don't want um, the aggregate of humans freely selecting what best satisfies their wants to be the direction history goes. It's it's definitely anti-individual. I mean, I think it's ultimately anti human It's definitely anti-individual. Yes, viewpoint. for sure. And that's that. As I think I've stressed, I think it's very important and other people don't value morally, but that's really what I value. It's just like 8 billion individuals or in our yes. case, whatever, 330 million individuals. And yeah, so it's an anti-individual thing. It's not as overtly anti-human as the modern environmental right. movement. Again, yeah. they're play because it's ultimately like sacrifice human beings so that dirt doesn't get moved. Yes. But they're so, I, I, yeah, I really think they're, after this conversation, they're more intertwined in my mind than ever. Because you need you, you need one tool to leverage uh, control over the other. So, yeah, and they want to control Bitcoin by controlling energy. Yeah, and what is it? Kissinger and in particular, said, Bitcoin is intertwined in that way. Yeah, Kissinger, I think, said if you want to control society, you need to control food, energy, money. It's like the main networks of human inter interaction yeah, and you control so. food by controlling energy and money yeah so i mean it's it's uh that's just one final optimistic note is like i'm noticing with these i like these conversations a lot and, and you know this one in particular i love the topics we got into but i'm like i'm very heartened by as i've been developing my perspective i mean what, two things have happened one is i like i sort of keep becoming even more convinced about this perspective. Like I keep getting clearer on the framework and I keep getting clearer on like, like I'm much more pro fossil fuels than I was when I wrote the moral case right. for fossil fuels. <laughs> I actually didn't expect, I actually thought I was going to be less when I did the second book. Yeah. But then I actually had a, some help, including this guy Ankar who works at Ayn Rand Institute. Like he helped my thinking in a bunch of ways. And it's like, yeah. oh, wow. Believe it or not, I wasn't at pro enough fossil fuels. <laughs> I wasn't clear. I wasn't as much on the human flourishing framework as I, as I thought, but it's, it's also cool that a lot of people are finding this compelling. And I think more and more they're seeing a difference between the humanistic approach to thinking about energy and the dominant approach. And there it's, I'm not the only one, I think I'm the most like deliberately focused on the philosophy, but there's this guy, Michael Schellenberger, who does really good work. He wrote a book called Apocalypse Never. Uh, there's a guy named Bjorn Lomborg who does a lot of good work. I disagree mm -hmm. with him on more stuff than I do Schellenberger, but he's generally in this humanist. There's a guy named Robert Bryce, a guy named Matt Ridley. And it's this growing movement, which I've had some influence in growing and other people have just sort of come to it in their own way. But what you're noticing is nobody has an answer to us. They right. really don't have an answer. And their main answer is trying to ignore us. And that doesn't work for so long. It, that only works for so long. And then they try to straw man us. And the historical way this whole thing was framed was as a, and it is still, they try to do it as the whole issue of energy is not framed as an energy issue. It's framed as, do you believe in climate change or not? It's mm. so like you're a climate change believer. And then that's packaged with eliminate fossil fuels or your climate change denier. And then you're pro fossil fuels. So notice this is all on the whole focus of impact. It's saying like, right. do you believe, the whole focus is, do you believe we impact the climate? That's bad. Or if we don't impact the climate, that's okay. Right. Versus on a humanistic thing, it's no, what advances human flourishing? And so with that focus, the energy humanists are saying, hey, do fossil fuels overall advance human flourishing? And hey, let's look at the benefits and let's look at the side effects. And even with climate, let's not assume that it's bad. Let's look at it from a humanistic perspective. Right. So let's look at the positives and negatives on climate. And then how can we master them? And then what are the benefits that come with them? And the thing is, nobody has an argument. This is just the, obviously the right way to do it when you get it. And nobody has an argument and they're just ignoring it and they're just straw manning it. And so I'm really excited to get the opportunity to talk to you and other smart people because it's just, nobody has come back to me 
in any of these interviews and said, oh, you know what? This fantastic guy who was like a catastrophist for renewables had this fantastic argument against you. It's more like, yeah. no, they don't have anything. Right. Because climate, climate change, we impact climate. But the idea of apocalyptic climate impact is a total superstition. Yeah. And the more that there are those of us who say, yes, we impact climate, but we actually are making climate more livable overall, and this apocalypse is impossible, they have no answer. Their whole, their whole answer is to straw man us as, you don't believe we have any impact on climate. Nor I say, no, we do. And right. we think it's yeah. we should still be doing using fossil fuels because that's what's actually good if you look at the full context for human flourishing. Yeah. Well, it's well said. I mean, I'm really glad you're doing this. Uh, and I appreciate the conversation. It's been enlightening for me. I uh, would love to talk to you again. Um, you want to just maybe tell people where they can find you? Sure. So one place is Twitter. I I I actually love Twitter and I meet a lot of interesting people there. So I tweet a lot at Alex Epstein. Uh, hopefully I won't get kicked off. I think I have the magic formula for not getting kicked <laughs> off, which I, I won't say, but don't, don't, if Jack is watching this, I, I actually met him very briefly once. So hopefully <laughs> you're not, not that you control it, but don't kick me off. Uh, and then to make sure you follow me in case I get kicked off, or even if I don't, um, if you go to that website, energytalkingpoints.com, just enter in your email address and I, I send out a newsletter once a week, and that keeps you updated on everything else. And then I guess if you're intrigued by this, I would say check out the uh, Moral Case for Fossil Fuels. And I guess people might like I have a podcast called Power Hour. I have two, actually. One is behind me called The Human Flourishing Project, which is more on these kind of philosophy issues. So people might like that. I don't promote it much, but I like it a lot. A lot of It has kind of a very devoted, small fan base. Yeah. And then Power Hour, if you like energy, there are hundreds of hours of me talking about uh, energy. So you, awesome. You'll have as much as you need or more. Awesome. Alex, man, thank you so much. Uh, this is worldview expanding for me, and I'm sure many other people will appreciate this as well. So thanks again for coming on. Thank you. I had a great time.